Right. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> we are starting our afternoon session of the open consultations. Before the lunch, we were on, um, we had just finished agenda item 2C, that's comments on day zero, logistics of IGF 2017, lessons learned and suggestions for improvement. Am I correct? There's nobody else who wants to make an intervention on that um, agenda item? Okay, so the, oh, sorry, I have to count to six. <laughs> oh, you do? Yes, please. Jianhong, please, yes. Uh, thank you, Chen Getai. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Xianhong, representing UNESCO. And uh, thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor. And I uh, also like to congratulate everyone and also our IGF secretary for the successful IGF in Geneva last year. <laughs> I, I was there, and uh, we had uh, maybe a very short on the pre-event day zero, we had a very, very successful pre-event uh, on the day zero to launch a new uh, publication of UNESCO about the multi-stakeholderism approach. Uh, we, it was really successful because the room was full and people were standing so well attended a very quality discussion. So I do see a huge value added of the day zero as a warming up session to the whole program. And also it provides a sort of flexibility for the stakeholders to uh, organize discussion on some very recent uh, new initiatives uh, to, to prepare for the IGF discussion on, on, on the official days. So I really think it should really be recognized as a as, a, as a, I mean, the, the whole IGF program to facilitate uh, more participation from the stakeholders. That's one of my uh, comments. Uh, and also I'd like to uh, thank the Mike uh, to, uh, uh, to give me UNESCO an uh, opportunity to share another recent outcome of the organization. Uh, since I will be uh, leaving a little bit early, so I'd like to uh, add up to my intervention now, if you allow. Uh, you know, after 12 years of supporting, engaging with IGF uh, by UNESCO, we have been so much inspired uh, by the, all the debate, discussion we do, uh, formulate uh, some solid outcome from the 10-year process. It's, it was in 2015, UNESCO has, uh, uh, has endorsed officially a, f a new framework called Internet Universality Framework, which we advocate the internet uh, to advance SDGs and inclusive knowledge societies by enabling an internet um, with aligning with the international standards in terms of the human rights based, in terms of openness, in, ter in terms of accessibility by all, and are driven by the multi stakeholder uh, participation and the governance. And this new framework has integrated UNESCO's mandate area to the existing IGF debates and also the WISIS uh, process. Um, and also we'd like to thank the uh, general support by the Swedish government and the international internet society. We are able to uh, launch the new uh, effort to give the teeth to these four major principles. We, uh, we summarize as a Rome, I mean, right based openness, access, and uh, multi stakeholderism We are developing the indicators to these four, uh, along these four dimensions. So, uh, so far, I mean, the past 18 months, we have been consulting widely with the stakeholders uh, during the IGF discussions, also regional and the, na and the national uh, IGFs, as I work very well with Marilyn and uh, Angie, thanks, I present to them. And also, I personally, we uh, went to the uh, Asian Pacific IGF and the Africa IGF. I found this really useful uh, network and platform for us to reach the uh, stakeholders widely. We receive so uh, massive inputs from actors. We have also launched an uh, online platform available in six UN official languages. We have received uh, hundreds of online submissions for phase one and phase two, which I mean that uh, for the phase one uh, from last year till the, uh, till the end of the year, we uh, call for the uh, comments on a general principles, which means what do you think the major dimension we should uh, uh, measure in this
there's under rights and openness uh, access and uh, multi stakeholderism and from the end of last year we have uh, launched the draft indicator based on the uh, phase one um, consultation, which contains 200 indicators, options to measure those dimensions. And uh, one dimension I'd like to share, which can be interesting for all of you, is uh, under the category of the multi stakeholderism uh, indicator, we have listed uh, the IGF as one of the indicator to measure to what extent uh, uh, a national state uh, is uh, enabling the particip participation from different uh, stakeholders to uh, discuss the policy issues at the national level. And also we have the another indicated measure to what extent, to what extent a national uh, stakeholder are uh, contributing to the global debates of IGF, of ICANN, and other international uh, discussions. So uh, we do uh, see the importance and the criticalness of the IGF and all its networks and ongoing the, the debates to, m to help uh, foster uh, evidence-based um, policy discussion at the national level. And uh, so at this uh, year's WSIS Forum, since we are here, uh, we are, I'm also pleased to, to uh, announce we are having a high-level session tomorrow um, at 1.30 at lunchtime and f uh, running to uh, 3 p.m. in the room one of CICG, we have we, are, we will present these 200 indicators in a more detailed way, and uh, invite we have invited uh, some high-level speakers to address how we implement uh, and apply these indicators after we finalize by the end of this year. I also count on uh, again the IGF stakeholders and MAG members to help us to uh, to see to identify uh, the as a partnership synergies for the implementation stage we will which will unfold from beginning of 2019 because eventually this outcome uh, this product of the internet universality indicator will be an internationally authoritative tool uh, to help all the states all the states all the stakeholders be it uh, private sector uh, NGO, academic, uh, technical community to use them, to apply them, to m assess, to provide uh, a comprehensive information uh, to m measure the key performance of internet uh, development at a national level. And uh, based on this, we can formulate the policy uh, policy improvements. It's not uh, aiming to rank or score the countries because, I mean, internet uh, development is massive, is uh, combining both quantitative and uh, quantitative uh, performance. Uh, but uh, we just want to provide a very constructive uh, approach to uh, advise the stakeholders to consider these four major dimensions, how they can best uh, develop internet uh, in, in a way to strengthen democracy, human rights, and a sustainable development uh, by abiding with the international standards of those in the areas of the rights, openness of internet, and universal access to the internet, and also internet to be driven by the multi stakeholderism I think I can finish now, and uh, I'm, I'll be around uh, for a few days here, and uh, at UNESCO, exposition booth outside this room. You can you can have a copy of our draft indicators and also have some leaflet about tomorrow's event. And you are also in, in, uh, invited to uh, to join our event. Also go to our online platform. We still we are we have extended the deadline to submit your contribution till end of the week. We have received so many uh, tremendous inputs, including I just saw one from the UN Special Rapporteur on Privacy. Uh, he and his team has submitted a 11 page. Uh, written submission, so you can you can imagine the the extent and scale and in depth of the contribution we have received, and as it's open and uh, transparent uh, access and process is ongoing. So your personal and uh, professional engagement uh, will be uh, crucial for us. So I finish now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yang Hong. Um, that that was also a presentation that included um, what should come under. Agenda item number three, but um, she, she has to leave now for another meeting, so that's why she gave the presentation now. Um, so um, I'll go now to um, 2D. Comments on 2017 IGF intersessional activities, lessons learned, 
and suggestions for improvement. Now, as summary uh, from the synthesis paper, uh, inputs regarding the IGF's intersessional activities, that's the dynamic coalitions, best practice forums, and policy options for connecting and enabling the next billions, and the national and regional initiatives, praised their work to date and made various suggestions for strengthening their continuation and support. These focused on ensuring that they are open, consistent channels of communication across the groups and with the MAG. So areas of collaboration were identified and their work was structured in a synchronized way, particularly where the publication of outputs uh, was concerned. More comments. Uh, more cross fertilization between intersessional groups and the national regional initiatives whose work and outreach potential um, is also seen as vital was further recommended. Regarding the individual sessions by the dynamic coalitions and best practice forums, and for the first time in 2017 by the national and regional initiatives, these were highly appreciated by the stock taking contributors and they would like to see these strengthened and supported. Whether referring to the best practice forums, dynamic coalition, or the uh, CNB, emerging youth initiatives or the national regional initiatives inputs concurred on the need for extended secretariat support and coordination of these activities, while noting that any expansion of the intersessional program should first consider the available resources. Uh, that was the Secretariat's summary. And um, I now open the floor to anybody who has um, anything else to add or any comments to make. Okay. Um, I see we have uh, Marilyn Cade, please. Thank you, Chair. My name is Marilyn Cade, and I am going to address a couple of the points that were made. My initial comment is going to be that over the number of years that I have been related to the national and regional and now the sub-regional and the youth initiatives, I've seen much, much progress. However, I urge that we not use the word intercessional when we refer to the NRIs. And I see there are nods of heads, so I hope others will comment. I'm going to explain why for those who may hold a different view. The national, sub-regional, and regional IGFs and the youth initiatives are bottom-up, organic, and consensus-based. They report to their own community. They cannot report to the MAG. It is just not possible. So the inference of intercessional work of the MAG is that it is work that is directed by the MAG. I am a very big supporter of the best practice forums, the engagement that is built in the dynamic coalitions, and in particular, connecting the next billion, which I see as intercessional work. But I would like us to continue to be very sensitive to keeping the work and the identity of the, of the NRIs. We find those of us who are engaging, particularly in developing countries and emerging economies, that that identity is a way to begin to build more engagement from the government agencies at that country level, and also then to help us bring more senior level government officials to the IGF itself. I will not name the countries, but I will note that over the years, particularly the last three or four, several government ministers or heads of regulatory authorities who were able to speak, particularly I will mention the SDG session that we did in Brazil, where we had two senior ambassadors come from the United Nations, and we had long queues of senior government officials standing in line willingly to speak for two minutes. 
some of them learned at that time that there was an emerging NRI in their country, and they're now big champions. If we tie the identity that is national too tightly, I think we burden the mag with work that is not directly theirs at the same time. I do agree that the mag should, of course, always be a cheerleader for the reflection of the work of the NRIs into the IGF and the reflection of the IGF into the individual NRIs. So that's my first comment. My second comment is that Connecting the Next Billion has been a fantastic initiative. And I personally, having also been heavily involved in Global Connect and also now supporting and engaging with the IEEE Advancing Solutions work, I hope we will continue connecting the next billions and make sure that S is emphasized. Thank you, Marilyn. And yes, you're quite correct. The uh, national and regional initiatives are distinct and separate from the rest of the group. But um, yes. Uh, next speaker is uh, Marcus. Yes, this is Marcus Kummer speaking. I'm speaking uh, in my capacity as co facilitator of the Dynamic Coalitions and also the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. Now, the Dynamic Coalitions have equal strong feelings that they are independent from the MAG and they're autonomous uh, entities, but uh, up to now I have not heard them complaining if they're put into the basket of intercessional activities, as long as it's understood that they're autonomous. But the uh, summary you read out right at the beginning uh, sums up quite well what was uh, the general stock taking of the dynamic coalitions and also the best practice forum on cyber security. We had sessions immediately at the, during the IGF where we already looked at what went well and what went less well and had calls since then. And one point I made already this morning was that there was a, uh, an interest in being involved in each other's activities, not in interfering but being brought in and allowed to contribute, as there is a lot of uh, overlap between some of the activities. And I think you also used the word in your summary, there is a potential for cross-fertilization, which has not used sufficiently. And that also includes collaboration with the NRIs. And clearly, uh, especially the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity, sees a huge potential there as cybersecurity is an issue of concern to most countries. And we have identified also a growing digital cybersecurity divide where some developing countries may be uh, left behind in their cybersecurity efforts. And we thought that it would be of great interest also to NRIs from developing countries to be part of this work and these discussions. One last point, and I hope uh, that this year the decisions will be taken earlier as which best practice forums go forward. Last year that was very late, and then also the hiring of staff to support the best practice forum was done rather late in the year, which uh, was not conducive to a productive work and outcome. Although we think we had a very good outcome, but I'm sure it would have been much better had been able to get started earlier with a secretariat support. So our hope would be that at the end of these three days, we already have a knowledge of what will go forward and the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity would have very concrete suggestions on how to go forward. And at the same time, uh, the dynamic coalitions also have a strong hope that they will be again be given a main session. And they already have some proposals also in terms of procedure where they feel they uh, are ready to align themselves more 
with the procedures that apply to also to the workshop uh, selection process, but we can go back to that later. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, do we have anybody else who wants to make a, a comment on um, intersessional activities and dynamic coalitions or national and regional initiatives? Yes, please. What? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to weigh what Marcus had to say, so not to duplicate. Mm -hmm. I think uh, two small comments, uh, having been involved as a consultant in the past and being very active in the cybersecurity BPF last year. Um, the first one, I think, is addressed to the MAG, that once best practice fora or other forms of intercessional work are identified by the MAG, then perhaps it ought to come with some sort of a responsibility and, and, and some sort of oversight. Because in my personal experience, I found that it was extremely difficult to get certain stakeholder communities on board. In my second year, I even found extra sort of yeah, the funding to go to and an, an, an me other meeting to get these people on board by speaking to them directly and otherwise we would have had no content at all that year. So the MAG members are the gateways to their communities. So when I addressed MAG members directly, can you help me with getting input? I got simply no response in 2015. In other words, they decided that the CSIRT and the spam BPF was important, but once I asked them, help me get input, n there was nobody home. So that, so that is one. The other one I made already in my previous comment, but I'll reiterate here. Um, topics come up during this bottom-up process. It is sometimes necessary to get more input and a different form of input that then a BPF can actually extract in a normal intercessional way. So there should be some sort of flexibility in the program for best practice for us. Say we need to organize some sort of a workshop or whatever you'd like to call it, the working session, in order to be able to get that content and make the outcome so much better, so much more conclusive. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Wood. Um, our next speaker is G, please. Thank you, uh, Chiang Tai. Um, now, under the IGF framework, every year during the annual retreat or annual session, we have BPF, we have open forum, we have dy dynamic coalition, NIs, workshops, main sessions, day zero activity, flash sessions. And, uh, you know, although I'm uh, this, uh, second in this my second year as MAG member, you know, it's still a, such a difficult thing for me to understand ho the whole thing. Can we, you know, in one way or another, to mm -hmm. simplify the structure, to, to, to have less, you know, categories, so that mm -hmm. to be, make things easier when we organize the meetings, and it's, it'll be much easier for our, the newcomers to understand what we're doing, for, for to, to to understand all all those acronyms is a already a you know very painful and excruciating task. And the second thing I want to say that uh, I already mentioned it this morning. This morning I was the, you know it takes me like a half hour to get into this place through Montbrion meet you know the gate. And this afternoon when I come, I wish to take a shortcut, and uh, I was directly. Um, very rudely denied access, and they, they say that the UNOG badge doesn't work here. Uh, but uh, as, a, as, a, as a usual practice, UNOG and the other international organizations have mutually recognized each other's badge. But they say that during the WISIS meeting, it, this doesn't work anymore. But as a matter of fact, IGF MAG meeting is not part of WISIS, it's UN meeting. Why should we apply, why should we just impose their requirement on us? And before this meeting, I talked to my colleagues in my mission, asked them once and again that, uh, uh, should I apply for the, the, the WISIS badge? 
um, would I be denied access? And they said, no, they always come with the UN badge. But now, today, I have been encountering, on two occasions, very difficult moments. And uh, I was wasted at least uh, half hour in the morning and a half hour in the, in the, in the evening, uh, in this afternoon. And uh, I wish to put on record that in the, in the future, can we arrange a, our MAG meeting in UN compound uh, rather than ITU? Because in the UN me compound, we have enough meeting room there. Why should we come to this place? I don't understand simply. Thank you. Uh, thank you, G. I will consult on that. Um, uh, the next speaker is Renata. Oh, go on. Yes, I must have been seeing things. Uh, the next speaker Hello, is Utah. Can then. you hear me? Yes. Mm. I, I think I heard Renata. So oh, okay. So let's have Renata first because that's whom I saw first for some reason. I don't know, maybe. I'm <laughs> yes, I was on queue for a while. Thank you. Renata Kino Ribeiro here. Um, speaking as participants of LAC IGF and Brazil IGF and uh, active participants also of intersessional activities at the Global IGF. Despite uh, the NIs and the, and the intersessional having different uh, nature, I think it would be very good to foster links between both. And also, intersessionals like LAC IGF have already manifested interest. There's a group who wants to have their own uh, best practice forum, so uh, further guidance and further uh, encouragement of linkages between intersessional activities and NRIs, I think would be very interesting because uh, NRIs are always looking for uh, global experts to, to dialogue in their regional context. So uh, I think this is an area of improvement for to and that definitely should uh, be a focus for us the whole year. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Uh, next speaker is um, Yuta. Yes, thank you. I hope you I'm too. saying that right, correct? Uh, Yuta called speaking uh, mm -hmm. from Germany. Um, I would like to go back to the, the topic of the dynamic coalitions and underline what Marcus said before that. Uh, the dynamic coalitions uh, have a really uh, important part in the intersessional work, and I think that has improved so much from the beginning of the IGF when the dynamic coalitions were somehow what was requested this morning that we would have a kind of format where upcoming issues were, were dealt with in these formats, and the dynamic coalitions were exactly that uh, about 10, 12 years ago when, when the dynamic coalitions started. And now, over the years, they have become more established, and we have found more ways of collaboration among the dynamic coalitions. And I'm speaking here uh, as a member of the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety and also working with the Dynamic Coalition on Access and Libraries. And I, I do see, see the overlapping in, in the topics, and I do see also uh, the efforts to, to collaborate among the Dynamic Coalitions, but I still think as a format, Dynamic Coalitions are meant to be addressing, addressing dynamically the new and emerging issues that come up to the agenda during the course of the year, and so they are also part of the sessions of the IGF and of the intersessional work. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jutta. Uh, the next speaker is Raquel. Thank you, Shengatai. Uh, so I'm speaking in my capacity as uh, co-coordinators in two of the intersessional works. Uh, first, the Best Brex Forum on Local Content, and then uh, the CNB, the, the connecting the and enabling the next billion or billions, as Merlin said. Thank you very much for your words on the, on the work done. Um, and I want to emphasize some of the points that Marcos uh, raised um, re regarding the need for an early engagement, leaving uh, the meeting here uh, in the next two days with uh, a clear picture on where we are going with the BPFs and the intersessional works is important. Uh, we hope to go 
uh, tomorrow and with the MAG um, under more substantive discussions on, on what has been done and what's going to, uh, to be for, for this year. Uh, but it's important that we take this early enough uh, that we can engage the community. Uh, we see that the, during the process of the, the intersessional work, uh, when you launch the drafting uh, papers, there is a momentum where uh, the community is motivated, uh, is contributing, uh, but also after the IGF itself, it, you don't have a proper follow-up. So that's another point we need to tackle. Um, and in terms also of the support from the consultants. This year it came in very, very late. Um, regarding the CNB work, we were lucky with our partners, our co-coordinators in there who helped a lot and we would, um, um, I will emphasize tomorrow, but uh, just advancing here, um, how they were uh, very good and the consultants were good in picking up and doing record time and good outcomes. Um, I also want to raise one of the, um, the experiences that we have with the local content VPF. Uh, we discovered uh, during the IHF uh, schedule that we had a similar workshop proposal at the same time. And so we decided to merge and it was a really uh, successful example also on how to integrate uh, and fully integrate this intersessional work into the agenda of the IHF, into the schedule of the IHF, uh, and reinforces the need that we don't repeat ourselves and work together uh, when we have a common interest on that. And uh, for the CNB, uh, one of the takeaways that is also important is by focusing on the case studies, on the people that were working on the ground, they were able to come to the IHF and bringing not only the color of the work they were doing, uh, but lending some, sometimes we are uh, in the policy discussions and we have the reality in front of us when they are sharing what they are doing uh, through the internet and for the internet. So uh, those were my, my highlights from the intersessional experience. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Raquel. Um, just speaking for the Secretariat, for the consultants, yes, as soon as the um, groups are rechartered or renewed for this year, uh, we will send, we will start working on getting the consultants as soon as possible. Uh, last year it was, I think it, it took quite some time for everything to happen, but it's, let's call it a unique case. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Wim, please. Thank you. Uh, hi all, I'm uh, Wim de Huxel. Most of you probably know me as one of the consultants supporting the BPF uh, last year and the two years before. Uh, but I wanted to make share an experience um, that I think is, is useful on my personal, uh, on my personal behalf. And that is that I, um, it's a little bit follow following up on uh, what Raquel said, that the moment a BPF goes and presents its uh, draft output documents at the IGF meeting, um, that you see that more people are interested and more people all of a sudden discover the BPF. Um, personally, and this, this year, but also the, the year before, I got uh, questions from people to explain, okay, what is the BPF? What can we do? How can we help? Um, and then you have to explain them, yeah, but this BPF this year is closed. This we, we are just, thank you for your offer to, to help on the input. Um, this is the final phase after the IGF meeting, after the meeting itself, the document um, goes into its final version and then is, is published. Um, this year I also received um, directly a request from somebody from a, from a government saying, well, I'm really interested in the topic of the BPF, how can I help? Again, I had to send the same question and also received an, um, a request from an, an organization, an um, European IXP organization that, that asked, look, we would like to publish something on, in our newsletter uh, on the BPF. Um, can you give some explanation? So all this are examples, I think, and it's important for the MAC to, to see that there is, there, there is, on the one hand, a discussion, a request from Okay, there has to be a larger input and outreach for the BPF. Uh, but I noticed that at the moment there is really interest and people are, um, uh, are looking at the BPF on how can we help. Uh, that sometimes you have to disappointment by saying, from, look, um, you have to wait now two or three months. Uh, and usually if you then contact them again, they're 
IGF is, is long, long, uh, or is much further down on the on their agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wim. Um, there's nobody else on the list. Does anybody have any comments on the MAG working groups? Um, this is the time to comment now so that we can take it into consideration during um, tomorrow and the day after. We had the working group on IGF improvements, working group on the multi-year strategic work program, working group on new session formats, and working group on uh, workshop review and evaluation process. Any comments on that? Uh, uh, G, please. Thank you, Changata. As I understand, we will go deep into the screening standards in, the, in, in tomorrow's meeting, right? Yes, but this is a chance for non-MAG members to okay. Okay. comment. So I would uh, save time for that. Yes, okay, yes, you. thanks. Uh, yes, Marcus. Mm. Mm. Marcus Gomez speaking. Yes, thank you for giving me the floor. I participated in some of the calls on the strategic work program, and I have to confess that I had a minority dissenting view on the role of that group. My understanding was when the group started, it will look more look at a framework on how to develop a framework for a multi-year work program without going into the details of what the issues should be. But the group on the whole felt it should also define the substantive issues that will be part of the work program. So this is a slightly different approach. I thought the substantive definition of the substantive issues should be part of the broader community and the MAG, whereas the group should set in place a structure, a framework for the developing the multi-year, the substantive multi-year work program. But this is an issue the MAG may wish to discuss, and the MAG may well ignore the minority opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Yes, I'm aware of it, and we will. I'll talk to the chair as well uh, when she comes back. So um, she's aware, and we'll get into it uh, when we uh, do this discussion in the MAG. Thanks. Um, Renata, please. Renata? Hi, Renata. Uh hope you can hear me well. I am addressing the point on working groups, especially uh, working group new session format and uh, the newcomers track, which uh, wasn't really mentioned right now, but I think it's a good uh, opportunity to discuss. Um, this year we had uh, this last IGF. There was the art exhibition in the corridors and uh, the working group new sessions format went with the criteria of uh, the lightning sessions. But I think we could, um, we could have a bit more ample transparent uh, call for people who want to, who are in IGF and who want to prepare the sessions there. Um, and uh, on the newcomers track, we could also have uh, people coming, the newcomers that are in IGF, why do they come? And who are they? What do they want to show? And that will also help us uh, talk to them about what the IGF is and how can they uh, uh, find their place among intersessional activities, among workshops. So I would really call for a more open space uh, uh, with uh, integration between these two groups, the working group new sessions format and the newcomers track. And I would really be more involved with the newcomers track this year uh, to, to coordinate between the different youth groups. How can we move this uh, forward? Um, these are very important spaces to grow the IGF, so please pay attention to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Renata. And the speaking queue is empty, and I'll give it the six count to see if anybody else has any. Yeah. 
other intervention to make? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so that closes agenda item 2D. And now we come to agenda item three, that is updates from related internet governance initiatives and processes. Uh, after we have these um, updates from uh, these organizations, we will have an open discussion on possible IGF 2018, not 17, sorry, 2018 activities and collaboration. So the f first person on my list, uh, hopefully she's in, is Valentina from the Council of Europe. Oh, no, sorry, from the Commission, European Commission. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Valentina Sharpie from the European Commission. Since today this is my first intervention, I first would like to welcome all the new MAG members thank the IGF Secretariat for their tireless work to support the IGF during the last IGF, but also throughout these years. And also warmly thank the Swiss government for the organization of what turned out to be a very successful IGF. Um, the European Commission has started a number of action and initiatives that relate to internet policy and topics discussed at the IGF. Among those, almost two years ago now, we started what we call the Next Generation Internet Initiative, with the ambition of shaping the digital policies of the next de decade by building a human-centric internet that focuses on rebuilding trust in technology and respect certain values that we in Europe consider fundamental. Aside from this initiative, the Commission recently launched two high-level expert groups, one on fake news and the other one on artificial intelligence, and both these groups' composition reflects a multi-stakeholder approach. This highlights how important a bottom-up multi-stakeholder multi process is for institutions and the influence that the IGF has had in shaping the global debate over digital policies in the last years. I would also like to mention all the work done by the European Commission in the field of digital for development that has become an important part of our activities and will remain so in the upcoming years, as we are among the biggest donors to less developed countries. Concerning feedback and how to improve the IGF for the next years, I would pretty much echo what my colleagues here said, that we should probably start to focus on fewer topics per year, uh, those that are more, the, the more relevant and require ar urgent discussions. For instance, this, year's, this, this last year, the relevance given to topics such as fake news, artificial intelligence, or blockchain attracted more government representatives to participate to the IGF, precisely because there, these are for governments the most pressing issues. We would also suggest to look up for inspiration at national and regional initiatives that oftentimes offer very good ideas and best practices for the global IGF. For instance, Eurodig already started from this year to have fewer and more focused this session and discussion. Um, a starting point could be the decision over the overarching team that can be more poignant and attractive. And yes, this is pretty much it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Valentina. Welcome. Next, I have um, Raquel from ISOC. Nope, is no, you're not, ISOC's not gonna say anything? Is there, is ISOC going to make an intervention? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, Despina, please. Thank Sorry, you. I was uh, totally ignoring that cue and I had my own. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. My name is Despina Saridaki from the ITU. Good afternoon to everyone and thank you for the interesting discussion so far. Um, like others before me, I would also like to thank uh, the Swiss administration and IGF secretariat for organizing last year's uh, event here in Geneva. It certainly gave me and other people here the opportunity to attend the first, uh, my first IGF and hopefully not the last. 
Um, so I'll be very brief. I just wanted to uh, give a short update on ITU's uh, internet-related uh, activities from last year. Uh, as you may know, ITU's Council Working Group on Internet-Related Public Policy Issues uh, uh, has been organizing regular rounds of open consultations on a variety of topics. In 2017, we had um, two consultation rounds on two very different but very interesting topics. The first one was on the public policy consideration for ODTs. Uh, an online consultation was uh, carried out uh, between June and September 2017, and uh, it was followed by a physical open consultation meeting in September here in Geneva. Uh, in total, we received 71 online responses to this consultation, which was uh, a record number among all our open consultations so far. Uh, the second one was on bridging the digital de gender divide. Uh, likewise, it was conducted between October 2000 and January uh, 2018. Uh, 52 online responses uh, were received, and the follow-up physical meeting was held in January uh, with different stakeholders present and a very inform informative panel kick-starting the meeting. Um, ITU's uh, Council Working Group on Internet has already counts uh, six open consultation rounds, uh, and there is a growing repository of stakeholder views uh, building up on our website uh, on different topics. Um, the inputs and results of all consultations, uh, including the two latest ones that I mentioned, are publicly available uh, on the Working Group website and can be accessed and consulted by anyone who wishes to. As uh, 2018 is the year also of ITU's plenipotentiary conference coming up next October, uh, the next round of open consultations will likely be in 2019 uh, and will be subject to any potential updates uh, on the modalities of the working group uh, that might come up during the conference. Um, in the meantime, I invite all of you to, who might be interested to take a look at our consultation archives. Um, the URL might be too complicated to spell out, but uh, if you Google uh, CWG Internet, um, it will take you to our landing page and you can navigate from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Despina. Okay, um, I don't have anybody on that list, but on my list, I, okay, I'll skip ISOC. I'll ha I have Diplo Marilia. Uh, Ernest, you want to go? No, okay. I have M M Marilia, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shengatai, and everyone for the opportunity to look back on Diplo Foundations and the Geneva Internet Platform main activities related to the IGF last year and some of the activities that we are planning for 2018. As you can imagine, the last IGF was a very special one for us because it happened uh, back home. And so Diplo was very much involved in the preparations for the last IGF, with, which lasted throughout the year. We participated in the Geneva digital track that was mentioned by Jorge this morning, and that included promoting events in Geneva that involved international organizations, trying to raise awareness about the importance of the IGF and to get them more involved on the day-to-day -day of IGF activities. Uh, we also held data talks. There are several organizations that are not very known in the IG, the deliberations and discussions, but that uh, deal with large amount of, of big data, such as CERN, and we got together these organizations to discuss uh, the management and governance of, of big data, and that was a very interesting um, um, initiative. Uh, we also provided just-in-time reporting last IGF, so we reported from all IGF sessions, and it seemed like this was something that the community appreciated. We know how low that the schedule of the IGF can be, and that provided the opportunity for people to know the discussions in sessions that were they, they could not attend in person, and also enhance the inclusiveness of the IGF for those that could not really be present in, in Geneva. These summaries uh, were followed by an overall summary of the IGF that we published just after the meeting. Maybe you did not see because that was uh, almost in Christmas Day, um, but perhaps you have the opportunity to look back on that summary too. Um, and Diplo also supported uh, with the IGF Secretariat the organization of the Art at IGF. And we would like to express our public uh, recognition and thanks to the Secretariat and in particular to Anya for all the work that she has put into that. We believe that many of the internet governance uh, discussions, they can be made more public and more accessible to others outside the IG realm 
if we mix and, and, and think about innovative ways of conveying information, and art is one of them. Another one is videos, cartoons, and you know that uh, Diplo has been very active in trying to, to find other ways to convey uh, knowledge and information. Coming back to our activities in 2018, uh, one of the things that we would like to invite you all to participate is our monthly briefings. As you know, in the last Tuesday of each month, Diplo holds briefings on internet governance. We always look back to the main digital developments in fields that range from cybersecurity to economic issues, digital inclusions, and what happened around the world, what is important to retain, what can we expect for the months to come. That happens physically in Diplo's premises at the WMO, but also online. So if you're not in Geneva at the moment, we invite you all to participate in the next briefing, which will be the last Tuesday of, of uh, March. And after that, we publish our newsletter, which also summarizes the main developments of the month. Um, something that we will be very much involved this year is the discussions on digital policy aspects related to trade. And this is something I mentioned this morning, and I cannot uh, stress how important it is because we see a large number of topics being discussed in organizations such as the WTO and UNCTAD, and there are very interesting discussions and pertinent discussions being held there. Um, however, many of these topics are not discussed from a digital policy angle. And it's very important to expose negotiators and uh, actors involved in trade to many of the discussions that happen in the IGF. We did that by providing a sort of uh, um, trainings, online trainings that were offered to negotiators uh, that are involved in WTO discussions. Many of them attended WTO Ministerio in Buenos Aires. This project was, uh, was uh, uh, put in place together with uh, UNCTAD. ITC and the International Trade Center, and the CATS Geneva, and was supported by the UK FCO, and we had a very good feedback from participants. And lastly, we just published um, a report that we would like to call your attention to. We are looking more and more at the role of uh, big data in diplomacy, and this report was commissioned by the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we tried to look how big data can affect diplomatic functions in the future, how diplomats could make use of big data to develop more sound uh, policy decisions on, on foreign policies. This is published uh, recently last month, and we invite you to, to take a look. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilia. Uh, if now I have ICANN, um, I think it's Nigel, if he's ready. Thank you. Uh, Shanghai, thank you. Is it possible someone else could go first? I'll go later, or if there is anyone. Uh, let me see. Is there anybody who... Oh, yes. Arnold, please. Thank you. And I can't see you for some reason. Yes. Top o'clock. Thank you, Shanghai. Uh, Arnold von Rijn, Netherlands government. Um, I'm speaking in my capacity uh, as a supporter of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. A few words on this uh, important global forum. Uh, this Global Forum on, uh, for of Cyber Expertise, shortly GFCE, has been launched in 2015 during the Global Cyberspace Conference, which was uh, held in The Hague. Uh, currently, uh, these, this GFCE is uh, aiming for strengthening uh, cyber capacity building throughout the world, in particular the developing countries. And under the umbrella of the GFCE, there are right now around 18 uh, initiatives going on. Multi-stakeholder uh, approach, bottom-up, uh, working together with governments, private sector, international organizations, and being advised by the technical community and uh, the civil society. It's working very well. Um, we had in last year in India, uh, during the cyberspace, Global Cyberspace Conference, a uh, side event, and uh, during that meeting, um, the uh, participants uh, came forward uh, consensusly with a, a global agenda on cybersecurity capacity building. And this will be uh, uh, rolled out throughout the coming years. Uh, I'm particularly happy that I uh, had the opportunity to uh, link the GFCE with the IGF. Last year, the GFCE had a booth and a workshop 
and this was well attended. This year they are present as well during the WISIS uh, uh, Forum 2018, having a workshop and sharing relevant information on the current status of the 18 concrete initiatives. In the initiatives uh, which deals with uh, several areas like CSIRT, IPv6 and uh, security internet standards. Very relevant and actual uh, issues and uh, hopefully these initiatives, initiatives will come forward with uh, concrete reports which we would be valuable for all the other stakeholders around the world and in particular the developing countries. So. Um, from from our government point of view, we are trying to uh, to bring this further and to connect uh, the uh, GFCE uh, strongly, more stronger with the um, IGF in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, Mark Havel. Thank you, Chenkatai. Uh, I'm not representing uh, the organisers of. Um, the process I'm going to mention, which is the organizers are the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, but I think it's um, relevant to bring it to the attention of this meeting that there is this uh, project which has uh, just held its second conference in Ottawa on the 26th to 28th of February. It's uh, examining uh, the potential for frameworks of cooperation to deal with jurisdictional conflicts relating in particular specifically to firstly law enforcement access to data across borders um, to identify how that process in addressing cybercrime can be speeded up when when data is held in another jurisdiction which law enforcement in, in one jurisdiction is trying to access. Secondly, um, how to address the problem of harmful and illegal content being posted uh, in one jurisdiction or based in one jurisdiction, which um, uh, stakeholders, including governments, want to uh, remove or have uh, some uh, facility to, to, to be taken down uh, when it's in another jurisdiction and then thirdly uh, the main name suspensions uh, relating to uh, again the cross-border issue of how to deal with uh, issues uh, of uh, particular criminality uh, through domain name removals or suspensions. This uh, is an initiative which is supported by several governments and organizations uh, including the US, Germany, um, Canada which hosted the Ottawa conference, France uh, and uh, organizations such as ICANN uh, are also partners in this initiative. There are many other partners. Uh, there's a track now for establishing working groups now that the Ottawa conference has defined a set of strategic questions and objectives for the work, uh, so working groups will be established, again multi-stakeholder, in preparation for a third conference in uh, Germany in June 2019. So um, it's a very important area of work. I think it's a unique forum in, in dealing with this crucial issue of how to reconcile the single global interoperable internet with national jurisdictional issues which uh, frame uh, jurisdictions which which are not aligned or inconsistent if you like and the frameworks for cooperation do not currently exist or are very slow such as the MLATs with regard to um, access uh, to data for law enforcement so I, I expect the organisers, the Internet and Jurisdiction uh, Policy Network run by Bertrand de la Chapelle and Paul Fehlinger will, will be seeking opportunities through the IGF to, to seek further support, widen the engagement because in Ottawa it's noticeable that there were few stakeholders there from Asia. Uh, there were some from Africa, from Uganda, Kenya and South Africa, but again the outreach 
needs, in our view, the, the UK government to be improved. So uh, I bring this to the attention of the, of the meeting. Um, I hope that's a useful piece of information about a very important initiative with a clearly defined program of work where I'm sure the IGF and the national and regional IGFs will be able to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Raquel? Finally, it's me. All right, great. <laughs> it's not a glitch <laughs> in the system. <laughs> okay. uh, but um, I, I'm going to pass my, the word for my colleague uh, who is going to speak about the Internet Society, Constance Bumelar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. So just to share a few words about um, the Internet Society's work in the field of Internet uh, governance. We've decided this year to uh, initiate um, a series of activities uh, in the field of Internet governance and trying to push what we call multi-stakeholder uh, governance partnerships. Uh, we have one specific initiative uh, focusing on strengthening uh, academic networks um, and also uh, supporting at the domestic level multi-stakeholder working groups that handle um, very specific uh, issues. So I'll just give one example. We have a working group uh, underway um, in partnership with Canada, in partnership with uh, the multi-stakeholder community of Canada, civil society, business, um, co-led by our regional bureau director for North America, working on uh, a series of uh, uh, best practices around IoT security. Um, and thi this, this kind of effort is something we're trying to replicate on the different continents. We have another effort in, in France, another one actually in Switzerland, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is really the, the, the general direction that the society is taking for its work. Um, we know that in the past we've been able to secure uh, the recognition of the value of the multi-stakeholder model, including uh, the IGF. But we're, what we're trying to do this year is really move from the declarations to uh, more concrete uh, actions. And of course, our support to the IGF uh, is part of that effort, the global IGF, but also the national and regional type of IGF initiatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Constance. Anybody else from the floor before I call upon Nigel again? Six count. Nigel, are you ready? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry, good afternoon. Nigel Hickson, uh, I can. I didn't mean to uh, delay anything. Uh, I, I, I won't be uh, long, so we can have a tea break or, or whatever you... Uh, you know, whatever you want. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, I think first of all, I, I spoke briefly in the donors meeting at lunchtime, but of course not many people were there. And the first thing I, I really wanted to uh, to mention is is how important I can believe the IGF is. Now, I mean, this, this is easy to say. This is just, you know, anyone can declare they think the IGF is is important. But we believe it's important fundamentally at this time, at this time in history, because of the prevailing uh, problems we have in internet policies. Now, I mean, this is not, you know, this is not rocket science. This is not difficult to see. One doesn't have to go too far to see the, the issues that uh, are confronting the internet. And we might say, well, you know, this is the internet, we're worried about internet governance in the IGF. This isn't our concern. But I would argue that it's all our concerns. Internet governance, what is it? Perhaps it's a phrase we should give up, which is very unusual for me to say this because I've been a great advocate of the words internet governance. But internet governance covers internet issues, and it's the internet issues which our ministers in different governments, which our stakeholders are confronting which our international companies and businesses are confronting. And there are significant problems in many countries. There are significant problems in many corporations. And so I think the ability of stakeholders to come together to discuss these issues is more important now than it ever was. We are seeing multilateral uh, initiatives spring up. Perhaps they're not successful. The UN 
tried to run this government group of experts on cyber security, which I think was a mistake to do it without other stakeholders, to involve technical issues in, uh, in the issue of cyber security, which needs the input of other stakeholders. There are other multilateral initiatives involving perhaps e-commerce and perhaps other, and other areas where I think the input of all stakeholders is important. And I think the IGF is, in this context, if you like, allows this safety valve, allows this discussion to take place on the annual basis and then, of course, in the national and regional initiatives, which we're seeing are, are so successful and so important for this dialogue. And I think that's why the IGF is crucial to allow this discussion to continue to take place and allow all stakeholders to come to the table. Now, I know this is easy to say. I know that there are physical constraints. I know there are visa constraints. There are cost constraints. But surely the, 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 the IGF, at least of all the vehicles we have, is, is perhaps the most open, is the most transparent, is the most welcoming to all types of, 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 of stakeholders. And that's why, that's why we're committed to it. Uh, and that's why we believe that in 2018, it's very important that we have an IGF. It's very important that we have this continuation of this multi-stakeholder multi process. Because the opposition, those that oppose the multi-stakeholder process, I think it's only too easy to say that uh, you know, they perhaps weren't able to uh, get their act together or, 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 or whatever. So that's why, we're, that's why we're committed to it. Just a couple of words about ICANN, what ICANN's doing. Uh, we, we have a, a, a role in, in the internet governance ecosystem. Many of you, of course, uh, experience ICANN at uh, various levels. Uh, only last week, we were at our ICANN 60, 61. I'm not very good at these numbers. Uh, we're at our ICANN 61 meeting in, uh, in, 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 in Puerto Rico. Uh, you might, so what in many respects? Well, so what in that we went to Puerto Rico, which was incredible to go to Puerto Rico. We were determined to go to Puerto Rico. Various people said uh, Puerto Rico has been damaged by the, by the hurricanes. Of course, it's been damaged by the hurricanes. A lot of countries in that region were damaged by the hurricanes and that's even more of a reason to go and support these local economies. The people were fantastic, the environment was fantastic, the support was fantastic and we had an excellent meeting. I mean perhaps the subject matter might not have been excellent but the meeting venue was excellent and it was an incredible place to go to. The uppermost topics on the ICANN agenda are GDPR, data protection, which is uh, something that, you know, when GDPR is mentioned in uh, all good families, you know, you're told to go out the room or something like this. Uh, but the general data protection regulation is, 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 is affecting many global organizations and not just uh, ICANN at all. We could be talking here in a global forum on healthcare or public transport or air, air or, or, or the airline industry or pharmaceuticals and we would be talking about GDPR because it has, it has a global uh, uh, effect and it has a global effect on, on the registries and registrars that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that ICANN uh, has a global effect on the registries and registrars that ICANN has contracts with. So it, it, it is important from, from, from that respect. In addition to the uh, GDPR discussions, uh, we also discuss the ICANN budget, and the ICANN budget is, is something which you might say is nothing to be discussed here at an IGF meeting. But I, I, I wanted to mention it because uh, often ICANN is, if you like, portrayed as being a, uh, a, a pot of money. Clearly, the, the income into ICANN during the uh, uh, during the expansion of global top-level domains was, was, was considerable. Uh, ICANN has grown as an organization from some 100 people, 100 members of staff in 2012 to nearly over 400 today. Uh, and the budget is, if you like, or the income is flatlined. Is that a, a, a term that's often used? Uh, I don't know if it's a very good English word, really, but 
in other words, the income has stabilised, but flatline seems a more dramatic word, um, and, it, and it indeed is uh, uh, potentially uh, decreasing uh, ever, ever so slightly, so this affects the ICANN budget. The only reason I mention it here is that it affects our, it affects our commitment, uh, or it affects the financial commitment in, in various places, but as I said, we're continuing our uh, commitment to to, to, to the IGF, we think this is we think this is absolutely absolutely fundamental. That's really all I w wanted to say. Uh, I, I just thought I'd mention two other things very briefly. Uh, there's three ICANN meetings a year. Uh, our next meeting is in Panama, which we're also very much looking forward to going to. Uh, and then the last meeting of the year is in in Barcelona. Uh, which is in Spain, for those that uh, <laughs> don't know, so to speak. Uh, that's what we call uh, one of our high-level government meetings, in that the Government Advisory Committee, which is now made up of 176 uh, uh, governments, uh, are invited, along with other countries as well, to, to bring their ministers. It's a sort of like, not bring your wife to work, it's bring your minister to the ICANN meeting. And... Uh, uh, we think this is important uh, in that uh, high-level ministers are able to uh, uh, discuss, are able to tell ICANN what their thinking is on the, on the various developments within ICANN in terms of uh, generic top-level domains, in terms of the success or otherwise of the IANA transition and other issues. And that high-level meeting takes place on the 22nd of October. Uh, at the, uh, the Monday of the ICANN meeting. It's hosted by the Spanish government and all governments should be receiving uh, uh, invites through their, through, their foreign, through their foreign ministries. So thank you, Shangatai, for, uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, and the, yeah, I think I'll stop there and I won't say anything about day zero at all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Marilia, please. Thank you, Shangitai, and sorry for taking the floor again. It's just to mention something that I think is uh, relevant for, for the community who will be participating in MAG meetings. Um, the Geneva Internet Platform and Diplo are also providing just-in-time reporting from WISIS sessions, so you will be trapped inside this room for the next days if you want to know what is going on out there and the sessions that are being organized by colleagues. Please go to the website, and this initiative is being kindly supported by ISOC and ICANN. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, does anybody else have any um, contributions to um, tell us about on their um, internet governance initiatives? Six count. Okay. So the next part of the agenda is um, an open discussion on possible ways that we can interact with these initiatives that have presented just now um, with the IGF um, this year leading up. So if anybody has got any ideas or would like to make a comment on how we can interact with um, these initiatives, please sign up. Okay, uh, Mark, please. Thank you, Chengatai. Mark of our UK government. Well, other than just to make a, a very obvious point that many of these initiatives provide, op provide opportunities uh, for yourselves uh, on the Secretariat, me, you personally, um, for, the, for the chair of the MAG, Lynn, and uh, maybe others, to engage and to promote the importance of um, participating and contributing to the work of the IGF and also of the national and regional IGFs and also um, identify how uh, these initiatives, and I mentioned the Global Internet and Jurisdiction Initiative, how these initiatives might actually be able to use this forum, this the Global Forum, to advance their objectives, increase their outreach, and uh, 
levels of productive participation amongst all the, the stakeholder con constituencies in all types of economy. Um, so I just underline that point. I, um, the IGF can't work in isolation, and it's very, very important to have this agenda item about uh, other uh, initiatives going on, which are, are going to intersect productively uh, as frameworks of cooperation among stakeholders, governments, private sector, civil society, academia, uh, and the technical community uh, as uh, in order to develop the uh, solutions for the problem areas and uh, the opportunities for cooperation in delivering the future, be it AI, blockchain or whatever. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, yes, that, that, that is correct. Um, since we do share some common stakeholders with many of these initiatives and um, it, it, we do take the opportunity to do some um, outreach and also capacity building uh, when we do go there, yes. Oh. Before I hand it back to the chair, Wood. <laughs> Thank you, Shingatai. Uh, Walter Natris. Um, I'm going to cite from the report on strengthened cooperation within the context of the IGF because it's um, the right place to do so. Um, what happened basically is that the participants indicated that uh, for the IGF to become more influential, it is necessary for the MAG to connect the dots and search for over-the-top topics in close cooperation with other more specialized stakeholder communities. And it advises to set up a form of liaison system with other internet governance organizations so that you can actually actively look at topics that will influence or directly impact the work of another organization that may not now be familiar or in, in familiar in time with the work going on in other organizations. And this is all set from a point of view if you look for more tangible outcomes out of the IGF. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wood. Uh, we have one presentation from the World Economic Forum, but they're going to come here at um, 4.30 because they're holding a workshop now. So um, we might interrupt the discussion when they come in. But um, let me take this opportunity to hand the control back to Lynn, the chair. She has no rest. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. So I... I guess at this point there are no other um, speakers in the Peter. queue. Mm -hmm. Peter Hellman um, is looking for the queue from the floor. Peter? This one. Ah. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, um, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I haven't been very active in uh, recent years, um, but um, I'm, I'm just curious, I've seen the presentation on the national and regional initiatives. How much are we actually seeing sort of in a systematic fashion reporting from those national and regional initiatives to inform the global IGF? Is there some, some s standardized way of getting input from uh, their um, meetings and outcomes and recommendations that can inform us here? Thank you. Yes, and I'll give it to, over to Anya to tell us exactly how that is done. Seeing from IGF initiatives, how is that done? Is there a um, standardized format? Uh, and how many so are sorry. reporting in and submitting reports? I'm sorry, I wasn't testing this mic before. Um, so my name is Anya Gengo, I'm a focal point at the IGF Secretariat, just for the record, and thank you very much for an excellent question. Um, yesterday, probably, if you attended the orientation session for the new MAG members, uh, Chengetai gave a presentation on the official record of the recognized national, regional, sub-regional youth IGFs, which is now 99, plus we have uh, eight NRIs that are information, and I think 
probably starting the next week, we will have El Salvador joining us, Morocco IGF joining us, and so on. Uh, when it comes about the reporting mechanisms that you mentioned, I think it's very important to underline at the beginning that there are no reporting mechanisms between the national IGFs, uh, regional IGFs, the global IGF, youth IGFs. Uh, they are all autonomous and uh, we all act on equal footing. However, we do feed into each other work, especially what you reference, whether we are informing each other. There is a very good um, mechanism that's uh, been established with the IGF Secretariat uh, in a very bottom-up manner, um, starting from 2011, I believe. Uh, that is that uh, each IGF initiative has a dedicated focal point or a coordinator uh, that communicates regularly with the IGF Secretariat, or maybe better, I should say, through the IGF Secretariat with the wider community of informing what is happening within their respective communities. Uh, the IGF Secretariat um, kind of followed that mechanism on our side, and in 2015, the management decided that uh, they will establish a position that's going to be a dedicated position to support the NRI work upon request and also serve just that position that you mentioned, informing the NRIs on what's happening uh, on the side of the IGF um, regarding their own work, of course, um, but, but also wider. So that's the communication that is happening. Uh, we have a regular monthly, bi-monthly calls uh, on, on uh, different subject agendas. It depends, again, on the NRI because the agenda is always developed in a bottom-up manner. But in that sense, there is a very good communication between the IGF, also between the MAG to the extent that's of MAG's interest, of course, and uh, of the NRI's interest. Um, and. Um, uh, as you know, probably just very quick reference, the, the NRIs have been, I think, successfully integrated into the program of the IGF starting from last year. They, ha they hold a main session. They, they also were granted eight collaborative sessions where a number of NRIs work together on a topic of mutual interest. During the uh, annual IGF meeting, we do organize a set of work meetings, uh, depending again on the, uh, on the subjects that are of interest for the NRIs and for the IGF. And not just that, not just at the annual IGF meeting, we try to use every opportunity where we uh, are physically present to meet with the number of NRIs. The latest ICANN meeting was also uh, uh, with, the, with the help of the uh, IGF Support Association, uh, a place where we met with a number of NRIs and that always results in um, uh, defining additional subject items that are of our interest. So this would be, in short, if you have any follow-up questions, I remain at your disposal. Thank you. Peter, I'm not sure if you have a follow-up question or not, but I always appreciate Anya's responses. They are just um, so dense with information and so packed, and the words are so carefully chosen because it, it is quite a um, kind of a nuanced relationship, um, if you will, between the NRIs and the Secretariat and the MAG, and she is always just very accurate and very thoughtful about it. So um, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Anya. F first of all, thank you, Anya, for this very uh, good report on, on the situation uh, and, and the collaboration, which is quite extensive. Um, you know, I, coming from the private sector, I'm always trying to find a way of how can we condense the information? Because if there are lots of initiatives and lots of people involved and lots of talks and meetings and reports, for someone who has limited time, it's very difficult to get what is the most important issue that we need to look at. So my question goes in the direction of if we can sort of, a, as a, just as an idea of what we could do in order to strengthen sort of uh, the, the connection between the national regional initiatives and the, and the global IGF and the messages coming out for uh, people who have not much time to follow all the details, uh, is, is there a way that if we have like a theme for one uh, international IGF to, to say, we are asking, of course, voluntarily, because they're all independent and eye to eye and, and the same level. But if we, if we say, look, this year's theme is so-and-so, could you please report on your, initial, uh, in, on your initiatives in your country, in your region, of what are the main most salient points that come out of your IGFs so that we can feed them into our global theme 
for this year and do that in a more sort of structured structured way that could really help inform uh, us. I don't know whether that's happening already, uh, probably is to some extent, but how can we also get that into some sort of a, a global reporting format where someone who doesn't have much time say, hey, what's the topic this year? Where's the consensus between all of the different regions and national IGFs of what are the things that we need to talk about and look at? Thank you. Well, uh, just very quickly, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the MAC chair will also respond to this question as, as the chair is very close to the NRI work. Um, I'm kind of avoiding always using the reporting, but I do understand what you're saying, and thank you very much. This is actually the message that uh, I, as a focal point with the secretariat, um, I'm always convening to the NRIs, is that the interest of the stakeholders that are existing outside, that are not directly uh, involved in the organization of their own IGF processes in their own countries and regions uh, is really high, and they're really interested to learn more and to engage uh, in those bottom-up processes and contribute. But then again, there is that challenge that we're all with limited time, and with the NRIs now growing, to be honest, it's also a challenge on the Secretariat's side how to channel all those inputs. Um, at this stage, what I can say only is that all your inputs are very much welcome to the Secretariat to advise what would be the most effective way for you to have all the information in one place about the NRIs in terms of the process that exists, but also in terms of the sub substantive issues that they're discussing, which I believe is of, uh, of interest for, for so many. Um, we are also trying, uh, we will probably, our management will have after this meeting, mm -hmm. along with the MAG chair, um, a meeting to discuss uh, these particular topics, and then, of course, uh, everything will depend on the final review and approval of the NRIs. As I said, the whole work that's happening with the NRIs is a, of a collaborative nature. It's a completely bottom-up, and they have the final say. But we will definitely feed in, and I uh, also told to the colleagues that um, every remarks that are reflecting the NRIs, especially this one, which are very important long-term speaking, will be convened to them and will be subject for the discussion with them on the, on the next call next, next week. So we will inform the community through the public uh, mailing lists of the IGF, probably even through the IGF website about the outcomes of that discussion. But thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for the question and Anya for, again, the excellent response. Um, maybe just one um, short addition is in, not only do the NRIs actually interface with the work of the annual program, um, but in fact, a number of other initiatives as well, such as the Connecting and Enabling the Next Billions, a major policy initiative, if they choose to, and there's overlap in interest, the work of the BPFs and the DCs. Um, in fact, Alex Wong just came in from the World Economic Forum, and um, they have a project called Internet for All, and some of the NRIs um, participate in that work as well, given there's significant work going in, in their countries. So there's a number of, and um, it, it is a problem to understand sort of the entire spectrum of, of information where, and what's important to um, any one piece of this ecosystem. And that changes over time. You know, what it is in March, it might not be, well, never mind, four or five months from now. But um, I think there were very good questions. And as Anya said, you know, she does a great job of taking all that back to the NRIs for their, their deliberation. Uh, we have um, Michael in the queue. Um, Marilyn and Marcus, but just for a, for a moment first, um, Alex is here as well. Alex, do, are you here for some time? To, okay, so we'll um, we have this queue going, but I'll put you in the queue after um, after Marcus. Um, so Michael, you have the floor. It is your Michael for the record. Uh, I'm I'm trying to get back to Anya, though she's trying to avoid the term reporting in terms of the NRIs. Because we have a situation whereby, uh, in terms of hierarchy, the NRI which is supposed to have an event first, then it goes to the sub-regional, to the regional, and to the global. Basically, what I've seen is a situation whereby, in terms of reporting structures, I attended the African IGF last year in Shaumashek, Egypt, where only, I think, about two sub-regional initiatives, like sub-regional IGFs, gave reports. The other three couldn't because they, they never held those events. And the situation whereby we had the African IGF, barely a week later we had the global IGF. But in between, 
there were other countries who were holding their national IGFs. So I'm looking at it in this way. Why should a nation hold a national IGF towards the end of the year? And yet, at some point, there's need for that national IGF to feed into the global IGF. What kind of reports is a national IGF going to give to a, to a regional IGF, which in my case is African IGF, when you hold your event after the regional IGF? That's my question. So I, I think there's um, probably a couple of answers to that. And I know Marilyn's in the queue next. I'm sure she can um, respond as well. I, I think the timing of when the IGF, uh, a national, regional or sub-regional IGF is held is, I was going to say, not all that critical. Holding one late in the year, even if you'd held your national IGF, let's say the, the IGF was in September, as it used to be some years ago, September, October, um, they can still, holding an, an IGF after that would still influence the process next year. It's a rolling process. It's a rolling process across NRIs and their own meetings, and it's certainly a rolling process from one IGF to the next. So I, I don't think it's a, a conversation that starts and stops with an annual IGF. Um, so I think that's one, um, one answer. Um, and I'm not sure if at the beginning of your um, comments you were sort of inferring that there's kind of a hierarchical relationship between them and therefore there ought to be reports up. Um, I think it's been pretty clear in the NRI structure that in fact that's not the case, that it's not a hierarchical. It, of course, is to everybody's benefit to share um, information, to share knowledge, and to share outcomes or conclusions um, as we move forward so that we all continue building on an even greater base of, of shared knowledge. Um, but I think it's, it's maybe more sharing is possibly the term that's appropriate in some of those instances than, than reporting. Um, having said all that, I feel like I might be coming into the middle of a conversation, so I'm not sure I got that right. Um, if there's some more questions, Michael, we can take that up over the, the course of the next couple of days. But um, thank you. All that helps with the clarification. And we'll go to Marilyn Cade now, who's next in the queue. Thank you, Chair. Marilyn Cade speaking. And I am going to just add a little bit of information, but very quickly, to what Anya said and, and ask a question. Um, we have sometimes, and I know that you did an overview yesterday for the new MAG members, but we've often had a update from Anya at lunchtime or before the session started um, on the progress in the NRIs. Um, <coughs> Sorry. If there's <coughs> enough interest in spending time on that outside of the regular schedule that might be interesting. Another suggestion I might make is just to point out, there is written information that Anya as the focal point has put together. And one piece of data that I would refer you to, and maybe although we have very few of our leftover reports, I think we could make them available in soft copy. and. It's a very quick read. 30 of, there were 71 NRIs that held face-to-face -face meetings. Not everyone meets each year. Everyone who holds a meeting prepares a written report. As Anya may have pointed out, the only way you can be listed on the IGF website as an NRI is if you meet the basic requirements of being multi-stakeholder bottom-up and if you submit your report. Of the 71 that met last year, 30 had met by August. So 41 met between September and December. And to reinforce the chair's comment, we have NRIs who purposely meet at the end of the year to take stock of everything that has happened and then to launch their work again. Um, so I'm happy to <clears throat> um, talk privately, but I just want to make one other comment. Every one of us has to do a bottom-up consultation in, with our stakeholders. And most, my observation would be, and Anya can check me on this, but my observation would be we all take information to our steering group, 
our executive committee, whatever it's called, to take into account the theme, but the issues and the perspective on the issues is driven by the community that is local. Thank, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Marcus, you're in the queue. Thank you. This time around, I'm speaking in my capacity as chairman of the AGF Support Association, and I can pick up to what Marilyn uh, said on the reporting. Having a report out is one of the conditions to be listed on the AGF website, and for us, that's a precondition of cons for considering funding a national or regional IGF. Last year, we funded 10 regional and sub-regional IGFs, and they received three and a half thousand US dollars, which may not sound much, but for the organization can be quite a big uh, seed money to get started. And 33 national IGFs, and they received 2,000 uh, US dollars each. So it's a significant number of IGFs we were able to support. Uh, and we uh, focus on those from developing countries and economies in transition. At the request uh, of Wisdom, the IGFSA will hold an informational session here in this room on Thursday at quarter past two, so all MAG members are cordially invited to attend the session where we can inform about our activities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marcus. Do remind us all of that on Thursday again as well. Um, so uh, next we have Alex Wong from the World Economic Forum. Alex, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my name is Alex Wong with the World Economic Forum. Um, I think I've met several of you now over the last couple of years, and I'm really pleased to first start off by appreciating the partnership that the World Economic Forum has been able to build with the IGF under the current chair, but also under uh, Yanis Carlos when he was the chair between our activities. And this has, of course, uh, been expanded since the forum became an international institution focused on public-private collaboration. And I wanted to appreciate um, our similar approaches on the importance of a multi-stakeholder platform and, um, and that we want to continue to build on that partnership. As a recap, um, a year ago when we were here to uh, present to the MAG, uh, as our portfolio of digital issues expanded, uh, we already presented that there were already two potential areas of collaboration, and i um, very pleased to report that both have had some good progress. Uh, the first is the Internet for All project that uh, Lynn mentioned earlier, which I recognize was also the name of one of the IGF working groups back in uh, a few, several years ago in reading through the documentation. But Internet for All is an initiative that the forum has created um, now running into its fourth year to catalyze the acceleration of internet access and adoption to the 3.8 billion people not on the internet. And the structure of the project has a 50 uh, organization global steering committee of which the IGF secretariat is part of that. So we're very privileged to have a direct interaction uh, with the IGF secretariat uh, and getting their input on that. And as mentioned already, one example has been the introduction of NRIs into our, some of our country programs uh, where we have Internet for All programs in Peru, Argentina, South Africa, uh, where we've had already some initial contact with the relevant NRI. And we do want to expand that uh, and, and build on that, and hopefully in a year's time we can, we can show that. Uh, sec related also to Internet for All is uh, we're really pleased that uh, the chair herself uh, is invited to our uh, global activities, primarily the, the Davos meeting. And in the past annual meeting in 2018, in January, uh, uh, Lynn was able to also present uh, the status of IGF to, the, to our Internet for All Broadband Commission a meeting that took place. Uh, and of course, we're also really pleased that Chengatai and Anya, the Secretary, have participated in some of the global activities. So on this area, we want to continue that collaboration. I think the NRIs, as we go more into countries, is a great opportunity to build on that. And, um, Hopefully in the coming year we can continue that and expand that. The second area of collaboration uh, ties to the fact that we have now created at the forum the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in San Francisco. So this is a new center that was created by the forum to recognize that the changing technologies uh, 
are happening so fast that we need to have a rethink on how we establish policy and governance on issues such as AI, uh, IoT, etc. And this is a really great success where um, through the intervention of the chair, we were introduced to the Dynamic Coalition uh, on IoT and Martin Botterman, who's the chair of that. And we were able to engage the DC into the development of our first draft protocols, um, which was related to um, how can we uh, put together principles that address the safety and security of industrial IoT devices. And the grassroots connection that IGF represents is a huge asset to the otherwise fairly top level approach the forum does. And there's a really great compliment there. So we hope we can build on that as the forum and the center in San Francisco in particular explores how we can address some of these other emerging technologies. And I think there has been some commitments made uh, in previous meetings with the MAG chair and our uh, relevant colleagues to sort of build on that as other issue areas get um, get focused on, and I think the dynamic coalitions could be a great uh, uh, model that can be expanded. At the IGF itself, we actually presented those protocols. By the way, a few of you hopefully were in that session, the industrial IoT uh, protocols, the first draft protocols. Um, and so we also used the IGF in December to present another set of, uh, of practices that was created by similar effort related to national digital policy. So again, um, we recognize and appreciate IGF to being a platform uh, to showcase uh, and, and generate discussion on some of these areas. The two new areas in the coming year that we are inviting and would welcome IGF engagement uh, is a focus area related to digital identity. And this is recognizing that um, as we move into the digital world, there are many vulnerable populations, such as refugees, for example, and others in general who just don't have any formal identity. And we need to be proactive to figure out how we can create identity and access systems so that it's inclusive and respects the rights of privacy, security, freedom of speech. So this is an effort that's actually uh, kicking off. And, and I think it's an area that we could further explore how we can engage the IGF. And the final area that I would add is uh, another focus area that's emerging, um, driven out of our San Francisco center but also in general uh, at the forum, which is around data. Um, data sharing, what are the rules? How do you respect privacy? Um, this is now becoming a major topic that many of you I'm sure are working on. Uh, this is another area that we would welcome uh, IGF engagement uh, and, and of course uh, adopting the multi-stakeholder approach on looking at the challenges and opportunities. And in fact, uh, this week right now in San Francisco, we are actually having a meeting of our community uh, on digital uh, economy and society looking at uh, two of these issues. I think a final, con uh, a final uh, comment just to show our, uh, our partnership with IGF and the importance that we have uh, is that we've invited Lynn, our chair, to be uh, not just uh, be representing IGF uh, in her capacity at many of our events, but she also serves as the co-chair of our leadership group, we call it the stewards, um, of our major uh, system a project related to the digital economy society. So um, I think that collaboration and, and Lynn's uh, personal in, in support and representing the, the IGF uh, as the MAG chair is appreciated and we hope that therefore allows continued collaboration uh, and communication as opportunities uh, continue. A final thing I'll just say is the forum is, is like many organizations, is complica equally complicated. Um, so I would just commit that myself, uh, who, uh, who makes a point of trying to be at these events, and my colleague Derek O'Halloran, who presented to the MAG a year ago, uh, we're both based in Geneva. Um, um, Chengatai, the secretariat, um, the MAG chair have our emails. At any point, um, if some of you are trying to figure out how to get in touch with the forum or this project or this dialogue that you're hearing about, just, you know, through the chair or the secretariat, contact us or contact us directly. And our commitment is to sort of at least uh, connect you to the right colleagues at the forum who are looking at that issue and so we can, we can continue that collaboration. So uh, I would end by that uh, offer uh, for not just these four areas, but other topics that you think um, that the forum is looking at and you'd like to provide some input, please reach out to us uh, via directly or through the secretariat. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was a very thorough update. Um, I've actually been involved with the World Economic Forum going back, uh, I don't know, probably 12 or 13 years. Um, 
in my previous position, um, partly because it was important to engage with the private sector and government participations that the World Economic Forum draws. Um, they are at you know, a very, very senior level, and it certainly is a different community than what you traditionally find in a lot of the internet governance meetings we go to. Um, I think that's why in the past, Kirkland's um, found it important to do that, and the MAG um, in previous discussions at that time supported that engagement and why um, I continue to be engaged. Um, quite quickly, though, the opportunities that are put in front of us from the WEF outstrip our capacity to actually track them, never mind participate in them. So I think one of the things we need to um, think about as we look through um, kind of the activities of the next year and probably this multi-year strategic work program is being really thoughtful about which of the, the activities where it makes sense for the IGF community to participate. So I'm not talking specifically about the chair or the secretariat, or, but where are the activities that it makes sense for us to participate, to what purpose, and then how do we actually do that? Um, and uh, you know, I think that's worthy of some pretty significant discussion and probably would require um, some more structure somewhere between the chair, the secretariat, and the community to actually um, bring that about, but um, I think it's time over the years I've seen um, World Economic Forum come much more into kind of the digital space or digitalization space or fourth industrial revolution. I can't tell you how many times I say multi-stakeholder and open and inclusive <laughs> in, in, in those forums, um, and there's been a real movement, um, but I think we, we should um, think about, because nothing's a foregone conclusion here, think about um, you know, is this an appropriate place for the IGF to participate um, more fully? And if so, in what issues, how fully, and how? So, and again, I think I put that under the kind of um, comments we've heard about increasing our, our collaboration, our outreach, and activities with our organiza other organizations to, you know, further enrich and bring in broader participation in the IGF. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them either here in, in the room or um, offline as well. Um, in the meantime, we'll go back to the floor. Um, and we have Omar. Omar, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to um, intervene. There, uh, there were uh, discussions in the earlier session, the informal, and the DISA finance raised some um, good points about how the MAG members can contribute to um, the engagement as well as um, possibly raising funds. Uh, some other colleagues uh, comments, uh, commented on that. Uh, let me share an experience of IGF Afghanistan with you. We uh, had 32 uh, organizations involved in our first IGF uh, Afghanistan in 2000. Uh, 17. We do it in March because it's uh, the beginning of uh, the Afghan year. Um, uh, it's uh, springtime, uh, and also when we discussed with IGF Secretariat, they also um, confirmed that this is not a very busy period for uh, other international organizations since other regional, uh, the global IGF is towards the end of the year other IGFs are not happening around this, uh, that time. So it's easier for us to um, have some uh, more international uh, speakers at the IGF Afghanistan. So that was a very good experience, especially with, through the uh, WebEx uh, and online participation from uh, organizations such as Commercial Law Department um, uh, Development Program of the U.S. Department of Commerce, ICANN Business Constituency, Facebook, ICANN, uh, IGF Support Association, uh, ISOC, Ministry of Communications in IT Afghanistan, Tech Nation, Tech Women Afghanistan, and many other organizations like APNEC, um, the Tolo News in Afghanistan, uh, they were able uh, to connect with us. Those who were present in Afghanistan, uh, they participated, the others provided 
um, uh, you know, talks uh, uh, using the WebEx, and that was a very successful model. We're happy and uh, thankful to our international uh, colleagues who were able to uh, join us. Private sector in the IGF Afghanistan was one of the major contributors, not only in terms of uh, sponsorships, but also uh, in terms of running workshops and sessions at the IGF uh, Afghanistan in the participation. Let me also share with you the amount of awareness we created in Afghanistan through engaging diverse stakeholders in the country, including uh, youth and women. Um, uh, one of the results uh, we could measure through the amount of fellowship applications uh, the ICANN received after uh, IGF Afghanistan. It was 19 applications from Afghanistan. Previously, it would be zero, maximum one application from Afghanistan for fellowship. And that was the kind of interest um, the, uh, IGF Afghanistan was able to build within the Afghan, uh, Afghan community and also the awareness. Uh, we had multiple uh, sessions uh, that were run by the ICANN colleagues, including w a few on fellowships. Uh, so Afghanistan was the second uh, country that has the largest number of uh, the uh, fellowship applications. On the government engagement, we were able to engage actively uh, with the government of Afghanistan, Al although it was a difficult period because the mini uh, b teams at the ministry were um, uh, changing and uh, there were uh, parliamentary uh, voting process going on. But uh, in the last uh, IGF, we were able to uh, bring uh, four colleagues from uh, Afghanistan, from the government. Uh, not only bring them to uh, uh, connect them with the IGF uh, and other in, uh, similar initiatives, but we actually help raise funds uh, for the government uh, p participants to come to uh, Geneva and participate at the, um, at the IG, uh, global IGF. We also help the government to uh, organize an open forum for the first time at the uh, global IGF in Geneva last year. Uh, with the private sector engagement, we are, um, I'm glad to um, let you know that we have uh, just planned a meeting tomorrow in the morning uh, with Temia's um, uh, initiative and we'll be meeting the, um, the uh, business uh, mem uh, MAC members who are coming from the business community uh, to not only uh, know each other, but also uh, discuss ways the business community can contribute to the global IGF, uh, our work as MAC members, and how we can uh, support the NRIs uh, throughout the, uh, the globe. So that would include uh, engaging um, new members, new communities, including startups, uh, the um, uh, IG issues. It also uh, looking into how we can contribute to the fundraising efforts uh, being carried out by the IGF Secretariat in the uh, fundraising working group on fundraising. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Omar. You know, very comprehensive comments. Adam Peak. Adam, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, Adam Peak. I work with ICANN, but this is very much a personal comment again. Um, apologies, I'm coming late into the conversation this afternoon, and would just quickly like to go back to NRIs again, if that's okay, and some thoughts on that. Um, so if there isn't a global IGF this year, and of course we hope there is, then perhaps there's a plan D or E or wherever we are in the alphabet on that, um, how might we, or could we enhance the work of the NRIs so that they become the vehicle for, for and towards 2019? Um, they could be connectors to the 2019 event. Um, they're not acceptable to the MAG, but to their own communities, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't um, be the means to, a, a vehicle to conduct work from now until 2019. Um, working on a set of common issues, perhaps more concrete topics that would then perhaps become the agenda that we discuss in Germany in 2019. I'm trying to avoid 
words like intercessional work, but this would be independent. It would be guys discussing issues of their own choice, but perhaps collaborating so that they, we get a more informed discussion, informed in the sense that the regions and national IGFs have already discussed and debated and are coming to Germany with those 12 months, 14 months of discussion perhaps by next year. Um, it would be unfortunate to miss an IGF this year, but we can use the NRIs to populate and make a better, higher quality 2019 event perhaps. Um, anyway, that was all, and apologies if this has already been said. There's a saying, what it's been said many times, but not by everyone, or something. I think I just, I think I just totally lost that <laughs> wrong. But, um, I mean, there have been similar comments as well. Um, we're still working very, very hard to have a physical um, meeting. We have um, a series of possibilities in Plan A, and then we have a, a Plan B, and again, um, hope to. Uh, make that definitive call um, no later than sort of early April. Um, if, in fact, we're moved to doing something virtually, then certainly the NRIs is a key piece of the system, would be a piece of that discussion and really look to see what we could do, um, all of us together. But I have to say, frankly, I hope that Plan A and Plan B come to fruition. Um, next in the queue, we have Mamadou. Thank you, Madam Chair, giving me the floor. I'm Mamadou from Senegal, private sector. Here, I just would like to emphasize the information and communication issues the IGF face in general, both in the side of MAC towards the community and also IGF output and recommendation to reach communities and stakeholders. Alongside these issues, I would like to stress the permanent problem of translation to say we will need to translate those recommendations in all UN languages to communicate better. As for, as for example, I noticed last year some BPF had some issues to communicate on their agenda and to collect input despite many, many reminders in mailing list. I think we need to find a way to help coordinators of those activities reach out to the public. In this regard, I would like to second Marilia for Deploy and Geneva Internet Platform Initiative on collecting and spreading information by their newsletter and digital policy on the monthly and on the monthly briefing on internet governance, which is very useful to speed information. Also, just to emphasize, also these newsletters are now available on more languages like French and Spanish. I think this information are very relevant for us to build a team going to the next IGF. Thank you, Chair. No, th thank you, Mamadou. And I mean, it, it's of course extremely important and essential to um, broader and better communication. Um, it's not resource neutral, so we need to find some creative ways to do that or to be very selective and prioritize um, those pieces that would really sort of support broader engagement. Um, any and all ideas are, are welcome in terms of, of how best to do that. Um, I also think there's an opportunity through some of the work that's actually done through the NRIs, which can be done in the local language, um, to both support the development of some of those activities and some of those topics, and then bring those um, outputs translated. Unfortunately, it's probably into English, maybe into the six languages, um, so that the broader community can a actually access it as well. But um, I, I don't think we need to go to kind of the English-speaking set of activities and look to translate those back, I think we really should should do more with the, a lot of the national discussions, um, which of course are taking place in, in uh, local languages. Um, we have G in the queue. I don't think we have anybody else online. G, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, uh, uh, just want to briefly touch on uh, what had been said by uh, Mamadou, um, as as a as a member from uh, countries, we you know English is not an official language. We do feel that uh, interpretation and the translation of documents is very important. But uh, this is such a um, you know uh, it costs lots of money, and when we are having the annual meeting, so many. Uh, parallel meetings are going on. Even the whole UN system cannot afford so many uh, qualified interpreters. So uh, 
at this stage with the all the financial constraints and the human resources i think we 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 have to you know uh live up live with this reality and uh, maybe in the future when uh, ai technology uh have uh, uh, significant progress everyone can uh carry a a small you know a, a small machine which is uh smart enough to to translate uh, uh, any language into into our mother language thank you thank you g there are no other requests for the floor um, at this point in time again i will we'll recall to everybody that we are in the final section of the agenda which was three which was updates related internet governance initiatives and processes followed by open discussion and possible uh, areas of collaboration. IGF 2018, possible areas of collaboration. So I think, um, and I missed a, a significant piece of this particular session, but I think there were a number of interventions from, um, I understand, ITU, UNESCO, ISOC, ICANN, um, et cetera, obviously uh, World Economic Forum. Are there any general reflections on where we might um, spend some efforts in terms of either thinking about the collaboration, how that happens perhaps, maybe on um, some of the topics or areas which you think are, are really ripe. Um, again, I don't want to close the conversation down prematurely. This is a time for uh, the MAG to hear from the community um, what their thoughts are broadly in some of these areas. So I appreciate Wout jumping in <laughs> and um, would also encourage um, any of the other participants here to jump in with any any reflections? Thank you. Oh, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Um, as I promised, I would come back to the, the report that was produced. Uh, again, I have to stress that I'm speaking here on account of 10 different organizations within the Netherlands, more or less representing all stakeholder communities and all IGF veterans. So this is not just my consultancy speaking, just to make clear. Um, as a reminder to the old MAG members, but, but, but also there's an introduction to the new MAG members. I think it's important to stress that um, this all started as a best practice forum proposal in the winter of 2017. And as more or less was decided which best practice forum would go continue, that was asked, could you present more information on the idea of then enhanced cooperation within the context of the IGF so that we can make a decision on this in 2018. And that's where these parties in and made it possible to do this research. And the answers that you find in the report that was sent to the MAG in February of this year comes from IGF members itself, from all stakeholder communi communities, from all sort of international uh, other organizations involved in internet governance. So it's basically you that come, have come up with these answers. It comes up with four major recommendations which I'd like to uh, share with you. The first is, and, and it's all, again, I stress, with the output of uh, the outlook of having uh, more tangible outcomes coming out of the IGF. So that is the outlook from, coming from that. So the recommendation one is to have a chance at full participation in these sort of in, uh, processes, influence and success where inter inter intercessional work and tangible outcomes are concerned, prior prioritization and focus, including a time frame, have to be provided at the start. If that is not there, you will find that several stakeholder communities will just drift away from the discussion. So usually governments, technical, and, and uh, the, the, the other international organization will just drift away because there's no focus on the topic. Recommendation two is if focus on tangible outputs through multi-stakeholder cooperation becomes a standard, it is critical to determine and facilitate the session and work formats that offer the circumstances that can lead to success. So in other words, it could be a session format that we do not have at this point in time, that which could act actually be needed to make a tangible outcome possible. Recommendation three I already read, but I will 
read again just to make it complete. For the IGF to become more influential, it is necessary for the MAC to connect the dots and search for over-the-top topics in close cooperation with other more specialized stakeholder communities. And it was adv advised to set up a liaison system between those communities and the MAG to make sure that it, it is possible to find these dots and to find these over-the-top topics. Recommendation four, once decided, the MAG needs to act actively stand by and fully commit to the work following its choices by assisting the volunteers at work in all necessary ways. Because often it's found that that is not always the case. You make the decision, then make the work possible by supporting it in the way it's needed. The report advises the MAC to start a working group on the proposals and to do a few pilots in 2018. So a working group on these proposals and a few pilots just to test them so that you can find what works and what does not work when you make a decision in 2019. If anything, the people responding here ask the MAC for leadership and decisions to make sure the IGF remains relevant. For the members to become true representatives of communities and not just individual members. Looking at this report, I think that it's a gift from the NL IGF internet community to the international community. And we respect respectfully request it for it to be taken into consideration by the MAG so that in 2019 meaningful chances can be set that provide the IGF with options to become more influential and meaningful through tangible outcomes that matter and change the course of things. During the work, uh, one potential pilot came up and I would like to put, put that to, to your consideration in the ne next two days. If the IGF is willing to pilot around its cur current work around, it, oh, sorry, the IETF is willing to pilot around its current work around a new internet protocol. The IETF is willing to inform other stakeholders, identify the input it needs from these stakeholders, while they have the opportunity to identify and discuss the impact of the change of the internet protocol will have on their respective organizations. This, works, this work is intended to go towards a session at the IGF at which conclusions can be drawn for all. So for example, to continue work or to work together within or with the, beyond the IGF and this lesson of the pilots are shared with the MAG for future consideration. The MAG is asked to further discuss this option as well as the report. But <coughs> frankly, what I'm asking here personally is to get some sort of commitment from the MAG to make it possible to start this pilot without a final decision, but by making it possible to really present on it by the time you meet for the second time and see if it's relevant. That would make sure that it's the, the, the beginning of the process starts, you can make a decision on it, whether, whether it's relevant, without losing the time, because then it will probably be beyond the summer before this work actually starts, and probably too late to get all these stakeholders on board that you need here. So that is my first hat. I have a small second hat, if you allow me. Um, the Cybersecurity Council of the Netherlands held an open forum on duties of care in ICTs in Geneva in December, and they've asked me as moderator of that session to give the messages of that work, but because actually they may involve a future topic for the, for the, uh, the IGF to consider. In 2017, the Council of Cybersecurity in the Netherlands published a guideline to businesses on duties of care in ICTs. One of the conclusions in that guideline is that there's a need for global harmonization of duties of care. In the open forum on this topic, participants were asked to share their views on global harmonization and whether the IGF could play an active supportive role to achieve harmonization. They had received these questions up front and what this session showed is that with only one hour, you can actually determine the direction of where uh, uh, a topic should be going and use the IGF to um, the maximum of its, of its ability. So it's, it's actually an example of what the IGF can do with the session without just discussing around the topic. So this led to the following recommendations for the MAC to consider assigning duties of care as one of the topics of priority in 2018. First, 
there's a need for an inventory of where states are in, on this topic and to identify current best practices others can learn from. It was suggested in the session that the NRIs could be used to uh, be asked to make this inventory. And on the other hand, the guideline of the, of the Cybersecurity Council could be used as a good practice and reference in return as it gives a concise overview of current best practices already in use. Secondly, duties of care were identified as a potential topic for the IGF to take on in 2018. If it were to do so, it is advised to do so only in a prioritized and focused parts and not as a whole. Part of this work could be taken on, for example, within the best practice forum of cybersecurity, which identified the topic as a potential topic for 2018. Other topics not or less directly related to cybersecurity could be taken on especially assigned intersessional advisory or working groups. And thirdly, it was pointed out that consumer organizations are not aware enough of these issues and were not, except for one person, present at the IGF. And it was advised to reach out to them at the start of this work so that <coughs> consumer organizations are also part of this. So thank you for your time. And if I may suggest uh, option D for the IGF. This is a multi-stakeholder organization. So if, it's, if it is impossible to find a hosting country, perhaps we can find a few hosting organizations that will finance the IGF and let it be held here in Geneva or another uh, uh, IGF compound, uh, sorry, a UN compound or, or facility where it is hosted by the commercial side of, of our equation. And why not do that for once if it's the other ones are impossible? So thank you. Um, I'll react to your last point because frankly, it's far simpler <laughs> than the earlier ones and I need to process the other ones for a minute or two. Um, in fact, that is plan B, if you will. Again, um, for those maybe that have come into the meeting here, the, the, the current state of affairs on uh, finding a host country venue for IGF 2018, again, 19 is secure, 20 and 21 um, uh, as well, look very, very good, and we hope to complete those in the, the uh, next months. Um, 2018, we're looking at a traditional IGF host country supported on a venue of their choosing. Um, there's a possibility it may be in a UN facility as well. Um, there is a um, good candidate in Asia, um, one with some level of interest, a little less, in Africa, um, two countries of interest in Latin America, and those discussions are sort of occurring as we speak, and um, one possible country still in, in Western Europe. Those would all be traditional IGFs, host country supported. Plan B is, in fact, that there is a IGF that is held um, in a UN facility because that does significantly reduce the costs in that the, um, the bulk of the costs that a host country bears is for venue costs, um, security, as it is a full UN event, um, some IT infrastructure costs, and interpretation. So those costs come down very significantly if it's in a UN um, venue. Um, in that case, if there is no host country found, that would actually require funding from the community. And the leading candidate there is in um, Asia, and you know we're in discussions with uh, some entities as well to provide some funding and support for that. So that is, in essence, what your plan B was. Um, but again, I, I just really want to make sure that we, we kind of be really thoughtful and careful about the messages as we walk out of here with respect to IGF 2018 and, and where we are. Um, it certainly is um, serious. Um, I, I don't think it's a crisis per se, um, and I don't think it's a lack of support for the IGF. I think there have just been a, a couple of funky things that have happened in this process where we had some really strong leading candidates early on that fell out for various reasons and um, other candidates that have come forward have basically found themselves a little um, short on time. Interest enough, that's actually giving us a longer window on the other end, so some, um, some good news there. Um, with respect to your other um, um, you know, very comprehensive comments, um, it, it's a, Wood's report is actually one of the stock-taking um, reports, and you know, what he just walked through is described pretty thoroughly in that set of reports. Um, 
I think there's um, some really interesting ideas there. Um, I think it um, merges well with a lot of the comments we've had over the course of the day here with respect to prioritization and focus. Um, I think a lot of different components of a talk to the MAG role, not only in determining what the IGF annual meeting program should look like, but also to some extent the role of the MAG going forward, how much responsibility we take for really ensuring we have high quality sessions and programs. Mike Nelson's comment earlier about coming in sideways as well as supporting the bottom up. I think all of that talks to, um, um, is requesting a different approach for the MAG as we develop the program. I think that's a conversation we need to have with the MAG obviously over the, over the coming days. So I, I myself take really careful note of that. I've read through every one of the stock taking. Um, I had one um, kind of minor question for you, and then we'll come to G, but that's, you participated in the working group on um, multi-year strategic work program, and you're calling for another working group. Do you see that, the working group you're calling for as really focused on, on sort of nurturing this particular pilot you're proposing, or is, are you sort of referencing backwards to that working group? Uh, this is about an atris. Um, I see them as two, two different entities, basically. The, the first one is that, that there are many recommendations here that one looks at the strategic working group on, on, the, sorry, working group on the strategy, the other one looks at new, more new formats to work in and perhaps there are topics that are even beyond those. Um, whether there should be a new working group or, an, or it merges with the existing ones, that is some th a decision that the MAG has to make. Um, it all leads to totally, n totally new sort of work ways of working with the IGF, perhaps in parallel to the existing working shop. Of course, that is something that can continue. Um, but my suggestion for, for a pilot is that, that to identify t maybe two or three topics in which the new kind of working is actually tested. And one topic presented itself sort of bottom up by, say, by saying this is something we really need to do in 2018 because it's going to impact a lot of people. And everybody, in the, at least in the room, was surprised by what was mentioned as the current work focus for in, within the IETF. It doesn't say that nobody knows about it. There was no recognition within a room of over 40 people for representing a lot of international and national organizations. So that's the suggestion to do that as a pilot, perhaps do two or three others which you identify yourself, because that will give you the, 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 the example and the experience to see what works and what does not work, because you can actually test what is coming out of it. And the, and the good thing is that it looks like the people that need to be involved want to be involved. There seems to be funding for the, the, the whole project beyond just simply the, 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 the secretariat having to fund it. So a lot of things are in place and that's why I asked the, for permission to, to start, start working on uh, the right proposal for the next MAC meeting to make a decision to do that pilot. And that's basically what, we're, what we try to uh, convey here at this point in time. So does that answer your question? Some of them. <laughs> um, at the risk of drawing this out beyond a point which is probably of interest to the room here and useful, one more quick question. Um, the IETF project you're actually talking about, you referred to it as Internet Protocol. I think your paper actually said it was in the security space. Um, again, if it's not appropriate, I don't want to draw that out here, but. Um, if, if you're asking us to, to consider something specifically, it would be helpful to really know a little bit more about what that particular um, one was. I see a lot of kind of faces around the room looking a little perplexed as well. So um, again, maybe offline or maybe even tonight, if you can pull some information out and send a note um, to me, I can make sure the mag gets it or, or something. If you have an answer right now, um, quickly, that would be fine um, otherwise. Um, I've been been trying to get into real contact with the IETF beyond email, and that has not been, not, I haven't been able to put that, put that off because they're at this point in time in London themselves, so it will be very hard to reach. As it's been explained to me is that they're building a new internet protocol, so HTTP2, and that's what the topic 
is at least at my best ability is what what it would be and that would actually involve a lot of uh, other stakeholders who have to implement it perhaps change laws around it who knows whatever that that's the best i can give you now and i don't think i can get you an answer here but that's why i'm asking to to make sure that there's a good proposal when you meet the second time and give a fiat to to start work on that no that was good thank you g thank you for your patience you have the floor yes I, i'm not uh, so, e so eager to talk but uh, regarding the 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 host country issue um I'm wondering if it is possible that uh, the future candidates, I mean, for, for 19 and 20, could we ask them to move forward? We have asked um, 19 to move forward, and we've been told um, quite clearly that's not possible. How, how about, what about uh, 20 and 21? And I think that would be too big. Yeah, they are not <laughs> ready. No, too big the stretch yeah. as well. But uh, you know this is this is a really funny issue. Um, no, you know, and I, I appreciate uh, you're pushing uh, forward and looking for some creative solutions. So. Yeah, but uh, you know we have to take into consideration and the f the, the infrastructure of the c if they are ready and um, the, the even the climate is uh, it good for all the participants and the you know whether they have a good security environment and better you know the the meeting be convened in different continents every year so it is it is really difficult but at this stage we, when we don't have a candidate uh, obviously we have to lower down our threshold a little bit maybe so so a couple of um comments on that i mean obviously in any choice of a venue there are certain criteria that absolutely need to be met and that is security. That's certainly the ability for UN security to secure the premises appropriately. Um, it clearly needs to have the right level of IT support, um, you know, capacity, and those sorts of things. Those are all part of the criteria that are made very clear up front with all of these discussions. So, I mean, I, I don't think we should assume that because we are later in finding a host that we are moving to a, a more kind of inferior position. I also want to make the point, because I, I have had this question specifically, um, while we are late in finding a venue, um, frankly, the schedule we're working towards right now with respect to the MAG is the one we've been working to for the last two years. It's tighter than we would all like. We really would like the MAG to be appointed during the previous year's IGF so we don't lose the last three months, um, but that has not been the way the IGF has operated. We have typically had the first meeting in March um, for I don't know how many of the last IGFs. Um, so I think from that perspective, we have the same kind of planning timetable we've always had. Again, it's not the one we'd like, but it is the one we've, we've always had. So I don't want people to con kind of conflate the fact that we don't actually have a venue with thinking that um, we are late and behind on um, all the other component pieces of supporting an IGF, because that wouldn't be quite true. Um, and again, G, um, fully appreciate uh, your creativity here. And uh, as G knows, he had actually, in fact, gone back to a, a country some time ago to see if there was support for holding an IGF there as well, and it wasn't the right year um, there either. Um, we have Jeremy Malcolm in the queue. Jeremy's participating online. Jeremy, you have the floor. However, that magic happens. Hello, I think I've just been unmuted. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. So uh, I am a MAG member, um, and so I should be taking the floor um, to the exclusion of others, but there is no one else in the queue, so I hope that's okay. Um, also, I've only joined MAG. I was uh, prior to joining part of the uh, multi year strategic work um, program uh, working group, and um, I think it does match uh, some of the ideas uh, in the um, up document that group has been working with, things do mesh quite well um, with the idea that, before, of course, he was also a, a contributor to that document. Um, I think the opportunity of having uh, a bit of... Jeremy, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could you just speak a little bit slower? Um, 
uh, the transcription oh, sure. isn't quite keeping up and there's also some static or something on the line, but um, just a little slower would help. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Okay. Um, I think in some ways it's good that we have some breathing room uh, between now and the 2019 IGF. Um, in the sense that, uh, even if we can't put on a full-fledged uh, IGF for 2018, we can still use that time to work on some of these ideas of pilots, the um, that the multi-year strategic work program working group is also um, talking about, um, particularly because the, uh, in 2019 there will be more support, more funding available, um, and so 2018 therefore gives a, a bit of time for trying things out and, um, and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, the HTTP2 topic that we've mentioned is, is one idea for um, a, a pilot um, on a certain uh, um, concrete issue. But I think there are others that could be discussed, and uh, um, the multi year strategic work program working group has given some uh, um, to that in, in its draft document. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just want to express support for the idea of using this extra time to prepare the groundwork for something that could be done uh, on a, um, a larger basis in 2019, even if we have um, a smaller scale meeting this year. It can be treated something like a dress where activities are piloted and, and then we have a, a menu of options that we could use uh, going into the 2019 meeting in Germany. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And, you know, irrespective of whether or not we have a physical um, meeting in 2018, which I personally am still <laughs> really hopeful and working hard towards, um, I think some of the um, ideas that are being kicked around um, uh, with respect to some of these new pilots or, or new ways of perhaps um, getting some uh, work advanced are things we could do in parallel in any case and still, um, you know, pe these efforts should take the time they need. And I think a lot of these efforts really should have broad community consultation um, beyond the MAG. And of course, those processes take time as well. So I think we kind of no problem in identifying that if some of the things that are being considered we think are, are better off targeted for a 2019 deliverable, then we should work towards that and put a, a plan in place to do that. But I, I don't think at this stage um, that is, um, uh, you know, um, the word I'm looking for, that it's necessary to, to um, understand the 2018 situation before moving forward on those kind of longer term, uh, more strategic efforts. Are there any other comments, um, either online or we have 25 minutes left? We can always return that time if people want to lose or a few um, kind of announcements we should do in terms of setting up the next few days and, and that sort of thing, which would take a few minutes. But um, again, the kind of open mic equivalent, if you want, it's the time when we actually hear from the community. Um, are there any reflections on um, uh, any of the topics we've actually discussed over the course of the day today or any new topics someone would like to bring up? Peter, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering whether it might be of interest to the others in the room who were not participating in the donors meeting, uh, if you could give like a short summary of what was discussed there and the main main issues. I can. Um, I can do the one I did in the MAG orientation meeting yesterday, if that's helpful. I'm looking at Armin over your shoulder, Peter, in terms of um, or if we have the slides easily to hand quickly. Maybe easier is to ask a, a show of hands whether that's of interest to a larger number in the room. Well, that's a good question too. Is that of interest to? I mean, a lot of people were here, but Marilyn, I'm, I'm seeing some no's, yeah, some yeses. And, and Chair, I'd, I'd like, it's Marilyn, I'd like to explain why no. I took the time away from other meetings to come here for the presentation. 
and it's trans there, there are some rough notes and the presentation will be posted. I think there's still other work for us to do and I think that should take the priority and I'm trying to get in the queue so I can raise another topic. Okay, so let me, I think that's a, I think that's a fair point. Um, I also think at the same time the meeting was announced quite late, I had a, a few people say to me that they would have been here at two o'clock if they hadn't had previously scheduled meetings. So um, I, I don't think it's a matter of choice and time that some people weren't able to come to the session just for kind of fairness here. Um, but Marilyn's right, um, the slides are posted, the webcast um, will be posted or is posted um, already and certainly Armin's here tomorrow. I'm here at Changatai. If there are specific questions, we're happy to, to cover them elsewhere. So right now I have um, Renata in the queue. Marilyn is trying to get in the queue and then Xi. So Renata, you have the floor. Renata is also participating remotely, so you'll either need to listen or watch the transcript. <laughs> Renata, I think we can hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, uh, Renata here. Uh, I would uh, like to address about the IGF Village. Uh, an organization I am affiliated with, we had a booth at uh, the IGF Village, the NCC, and we did some activities there, like uh, an editathon with Icon Wiki. Um, and I would encourage for uh, 2018 to have this invite to other organizations to interact with the IGF and to do activities along with the IGF. Another organization I am working with is Mozilla Festival and Mozilla Open Leaders Training. Two of my uh, uh, teams at Mozilla Open Leaders Training, Digital Grassroots, and Viva Las Venus, which are projects for training uh, in cybersecurity and uh, internet governance, they are, are getting to know the activities of the IGF. It's a whole new world that opened up to them. So uh, the, I understand there is a plan to revitalize the working group in outreach. Please have in mind these new organizations and these new groups that would really take advantage in participating in IGF activities in an informal way, uh, whether it is in the intercessionals or in a small conversation in IGF village. That's, this would be my point. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Uh, Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Marilyn Kate speaking. I'm going to address two topics, and the village is one of them. Um, as hard as the um, secretariat team worked, really that location was very, very poor. In addition to that, the structure provided by the host was extremely um, insufficient. Um, information was not provided to the uh, those who were in the village that they needed to bring a tablecloth, that the tables would be frail, that there was no place to secure materials. They had to carry them back and forth. Uh, another issue was the fact that, and I don't, I think it's the innovative formats, or they were located in a place where the microphone that they used, and most of them did not know how to turn the microphone down, because there was an opening over the serpentine bar, they were broadcasting into the serpentine bar. Parties who were not part of the um, um, IGF, but who know me, were complaining to me a lot about the, what is that noise? The noise also, and the content was excellent, but the, the, the presentations were also feeding back into several of the booths where people were trying to have dialogue, et cetera. So as important as the village is, and I, I support Renata's comment about it can be a way to bring in new parties, I think we need to uh, ask um, for a um, SurveyMonkey direct to those who had booths so that we can provide 
better feedback for the future. The second comment I want to make is to follow up on a very different topic, but a comment that Mark Carvel made. I am also participating for over the next three days in the WISIS Forum. There's a online listing of all of the high-level speakers. There are 35 ministers and deputy ministers. The, there are also some other high-level people. If you don't know, and it could be that you don't, know that someone from your country is speaking in a high-level slot, I'd be happy to spend a couple of seconds with you to um, go through and point out to you where this is. Um, I think it would be really great for you to take, for all of us to take advantage of the opportunity to greet the high-level participant. They are very often um, not from the IG community. In fact, they are much more likely to be um, from a ministry that is focused on um, communications at ICT. There are also some heads of regulatory agencies there that have uh, mixed um, assignments. There are several deputies there. There are um, a number of other uh, government officials, and it can be a really good way if somebody from your country is there and you don't yet, haven't yet had a chance to greet them, it could be a really good way for you to find a few minutes with them. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's, um, that's a good point. Um, I will send out, possibly later tonight, um, kind of the two questions I was posed, which are questions I asked them to pose, which is the way the process worked. Um, it's funny, nobody wants to sit through, you know, 40 speeches of five minutes, and yet everybody wants to give one. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so, you know, they end up putting together these processes where you were asked to, rather than doing your five-minute high-level speech, submit two questions. They um, were meant to pose those two back to you and not stray from them, and that was the way you actually made your high-level policy speak. Um, I was in a very big room. It was a, um, you know, I thought it was a reasonable panel. There were about 100 people um, in the room, though, which I think is probably a testament that even in different formats, um, people are not really interested in things which aren't interactive and are just a series of high-level policy statements. Um, at the very end, though, we were asked um, uh, a question. Um, so they deviated from the process a little bit, which is what is the one thing you would want? And I answered, and there's a transcript somewhere, and I, this was off the top of my head because I was expecting the question, um, but I will capture the comment, would, what would you like? And I said, well, what we would like in the IGF is more participation, specifically from governments, private sector, um, and senior policy makers. And you know, throughout all these forums we go to, we hear the words multi-stakeholder and open and inclusive and transparent and participatory, and, and yet it, it's not um, shown in the participation we have in the IGF. I also made the point, of course, that the WISIS Forum and the IGF um, were both born or created out of WISIS I and WISIS II, and yet had very different resources and support um, from a lot of uh, country. So I made that point. I mean, I was probably coming fresh off of the earlier conversation on the donors meeting and, and the funds. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I say that only in terms of the last point that was raised, but just um, in the nature of I will send out the two questions that were posed and um, kind of roughly my comments, um, there was some ad-libbing, and particularly that last comment as well, just in case it's useful, but more in the, you know, the interest of kind of transparency and inclusion. Um, G, you had your flag up, but took it down. Do you want the floor? You have the floor, G. Very briefly, um, I just want to say that uh, it would be lovely if uh, Changatai and his team can give us a one-page or two-page sheet informing us uh, where the money, our money are coming from, who is making the donations, and uh, how much money we're spending every year and on, on what we're spending. It's on the, on the web. Okay. And there's you know, two pages that will pretty much answer your, okay. your questions, basically. Yeah. It cost about $1.1 $1 .1 million last year to run the IGF. Yeah. We brought in just under 800000 on an annual recurring running rate, another 300000 or so that was overdue. All the organizations are listed with the amounts they've um, contributed, both in 2016 and 17. In fact, on the website, you can go back and look 
from 2005 or 2006 um, donors and the contributions that they've made and there's also a fairly thorough breakdown of, of expenses as well so once you've had a look at that if you have any specific questions um, Shanghai I or Armin would be happy to ask G one more thing regarding this that uh, is the secretariat uh, sending uh, letters to to the U your member states uh, soliciting financial support and because in Unidir uh, they they always do that the director of Unidir always send send such letters to investors asking for their um, you know graceful support <laughs> I'm going to turn to Armin to ask I'm not familiar with those processes within the the UN system. Yeah, I mean, uh, Armin Plum here from DESA. Quick answer, no. Um, we don't send solicitation or pledge letters out. Although, as I mentioned in the donors meeting, we are looking into this fundraising module that uh, the UN is planning to implement, and that might actually allow us to um, to do these kind of things. We also have, I mean, DESA has, since last August, a new Undersecretary General who is um, very much interested and very keen on bringing more governments, um, A, to the IGF, but B, also to the donor community. So we're hoping that that will result in, in increases on both fronts. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. And Mark, we have, and um, we'll probably close the, the queue, the floor after that, and make the few of the administrative announcements, and then wrap up the meeting. Mark, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Mark of our UK government. Uh, I just take the opportunity to recount very briefly a few points that came out of our feedback uh, from uh, Geneva IGF, um, which I hadn't mentioned before, points I hadn't mentioned before. Uh, there needs to be more government speakers, I think, as well as participation generally. Uh, panels uh, could have more government speakers and maybe the MAG when it sifts proposals could look to identify ah this session would really benefit from a government speaker particularly if, if um, there is awareness that uh, individual governments are very active on that particular issue like AI there are lots of governments the UK has a AI strategy team uh, looking at data ethics issues for example in the UK we're setting up a data ethics center so um, that may, might be one mechanism to get more government speakers by getting the proposers to send invitations targeted invitations out um, to uh, to individual policymakers uh, second point um, some uh, workshops might adopt the Net Mondial practice of a different microphone, microphone for each stakeholder group. I wasn't in Sao Paulo myself for Net Mondial, uh, but maybe that's another device for maximizing interaction and participation by the full roster of uh, stakeholder constituencies. Uh, thirdly, Panelists should only be allowed to appear on maximum two panels throughout the IGF event. So you don't keep seeing the same faces leading off on topics uh, in, in uh, sessions. Um, and that might stimulate more participation, uh, in, uh, of course. Um, shorten the main sessions, three hours too long. Um, that was one comment um, uh, and another point that came up about participation of youth I know there's been talk about a youth forum and a separate sort of place for young people but I've always argued actually the IGF would be enriched by young uh, people being invited to participate in as many main sessions and workshops as possible, so that they are integrated, if you like, in the IGF discussions, and they bring their fresh perspectives, 
their awareness of what's happening at the front end of technology uh, and the use of that and, and the kind of issues that arise for them in terms of, I don't know, privacy and so on. Um, so that was a, another, another aspect uh, I thought it'd be useful to raise as the MAG uh, uh, examines uh, how to involve young people in the IGF. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I mean, I think those are all good, good comments. Um, some have been tried before, um, and uh, but I think they're all, all good comments and important to, to keep them in front of us. Um, there's a couple of administrative announcements, but then I think we will close the um, open community consultation. I think the um, first thing I'd like to do is to say I'm going to huddle with the Secretariat with respect to reviewing uh, the agenda for the next two days for the MAG meeting. Um, there may be some slight kind of changes or, or reorganizing. On the other hand, if you've actually followed the discussion over the course of the day, I think you'd probably recognize that there are some um, sort of substantive discussions we need to have with respect to what sort of program do we want to build um, and where do we see some of those component pieces of the program evolving to. Um, so I think we need to have um, some time for that series of questions first and, and not, I think historically quite early, we would have moved into kind of a themes and main theme. And picking up on uh, one of the comments earlier about not spending three hours discussing a main theme, um, I think that's extremely useful advice. I think it's probably not appropriate that we kick off the meeting with that tomorrow. So I don't suspect there'll be any major changes. And again, having followed the discussion today, I suspect people have a pretty good idea of the areas we're going to be um, focusing on um, in some of our earlier discussions. Um, but just to, um, to watch for that. We are back here in this room tomorrow. Um, again, the hours are 10 to 1 and 3 to 6. Um, we want to remind everybody of um, the Swiss hospitality again at 6.30 in the CICG cafeteria across the way. There's a reception from the um, Swiss government, the Canton de Genève and the Ville de Genève. And um, there's a great shortcut, by the way, if you don't know it. You go out the door here, you look to the right, there's a little escalator, you take the escalator up, there's a red door, and you walk out right in front of the CICG. You don't need to do the long trek all the way all the way back um, back around. Any other comments? Any other administrative? Anya, Eleonora, Sengatai? Eleonora? Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry, I just wanted to say very quickly that um, over the course of the meeting, we keep on referring to certain documents, and I think people are, are having a hard time finding them. They're just on the, the front page of the website where all the meeting information is. There's a tab uh, marked reference documents, and I think, um, I think a lot of the people here will find uh, the documents, and they're very helpful. Thank, thank you. That is very, very helpful. Well, then with that, as somebody said, I can give everybody back the gift of four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's little, but, you know, it's something. Um, and thank everybody um, very much for all the participation. Thank you to all of the uh, online um, participants as well. Um, it's a long day when you're here physically. It's an even longer day when you're um, sitting in front of a computer um, by yourself. So very much appreciate the support and the effort. And, of course, thank you to the uh, transcriber or scribes, um, transcriptionists as well. Thank you, and, and, and yes, and for the online uh, participation person for all your support, ITU for your support, for the room, et cetera. Um, thank you very much. We will hopefully see you at the, the reception, and we'll see you tomorrow morning back here at 10. Thank you. <laughs>